watch those older summer flicks. And you're killing me, Smalls. Today, contributor Donna Farrison spoke to the cast of a movie that defines the season, The Sandlot. We found out why it still resonates today. And to close out our special show, we've got our friend Chris Witherspoon, founder and CEO of Pop Viewers. He's counting down the most nostalgic summer movie scenes of all time. Stay with us for all of that. It'll be great. To kick things off, here's a deep dive into how watching nostalgic films makes us feel, especially during the heat of summer. Summer in itself is a great example of a trigger for nostalgia because it connotes many of the attributes that accompany nostalgia, such as longing for the carefreeness, the leisure uh, of childhood. But when you watch something like a movie that's set at summer camp, you've got so many stimuli there that are reminding us that in our hectic, busy lives, should we not occasionally take a break? So, uh, either of you by any chance know how to play poker? Yeah, never played it before. Roosevelt, how's that lanyard coming? Horrible. Film is a really good example of a medium that has all of the triggers for different kinds of sensory experiences, visual, auditory, such as the music in a film. And so you have all these varieties of sensory stimuli that help you to mentally transport yourself in two ways, by the way. Uh, one, when you're just remembering the past, you're transporting yourself back to that time. An interesting finding recently showed that when people just reminisce nostalgically, they even feel a little more uh, healthy and vibrant and they have more vitality. Why? Because when you transport yourself back, you're feeling a little bit of the feelings you felt when you were younger. Nostalgic films, especially for uh, looking back to your beloved favorite uh, childhood movies, those were a source of great comfort. You're killing me, Smalls. Dear Darla, I hate your stinking guts. Their time, up there. Down here, it's our time. It's our time down here. In fact, in film, for example, we believe from the research data that there are characters in movies that serve as surrogates for us. So when you watch a film that you loved in the past, not only are you remembering when you watched it, with whom did you watch it, the, the uh, conversations you had at the time, maybe you went out to the movies with friends or what have you, but in addition to that, as you watch characters in films play out their own problems and resolve them through this vicarious resolution, you feel that hope and optimism, which is a lot like the happy ending of many stories that we've seen throughout our lives, right? If you wanted to uh, log them according to seasons of the year, for instance, summer is a great time. And uh, what operates as a nostalgic film it could be something like Star Wars, uh, episode one, for a generation who saw that for the first time, either as children, teenagers, or young adults. And to some extent, it's transporting them, not just to the film and the enjoyment of the film, but also uh, it gives someone the ability to reflect upon, what did it mean to me when I saw that as a kid? And now what, did, what would I think of it now? So sometimes when we rewatch an old film, we're comparing our understanding as full-fledged adults or our understanding now, now that we've lived through so much with what we thought when we first saw it. Also for the elderly today, they might think back to the great summer films that were beach movies. You know, the parties on the beach and playing volleyball on the beach. When you think about transportation uh, mentally through a film, now you have added on to it that you might transport yourself to somebody else's past or to somebody else's experience, not necessarily your own. So uh, fiction can be enjoyed and benefited from even in terms of nostalgia. For instance, a lot of nostalgic films incorporate within the plot or within the character uh, lines, characters remembering back to their past. I can still recall our last summer. I still see it all. Walks along the Seine, 
laughing in the rain. I was the last one to move away. But when I did, the sandlot was still there. And then when you watch that, then that prompts you to sort of mentally transport yourself with that character back to their past as well. So it's very rich. Film is a very rich medium. Our thanks to Professor Christine Batchel for sharing all of her findings and insights with us, a little better understanding of why those films make us feel so good. Still to come, even more nostalgia and more fun. Donna Farrison's chat with the Sandlot stars who played Yaya and Squints. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Breaking news in our changing world. Download the NBC News app. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the press now. Streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Welcome back to our Pop Star Plus special all about nostalgic summer movies. Now, if you're a 90s kid, you'll remember the 1993 release of a movie about a ragtag pack who loved playing ball. And it changed how we think about summer forever. Today, contributor Donna Farrison spoke to two of the stars from The Sandlot, Chauncey Leopardi, who played Squints, and Marty York, who played Yeah Yeah. They shared the responses they still get about the movie set during a summer back in 1962. Was the summer you filmed The Sandlot the best summer of your life? It was for sure the best summer <laughs> of my life. Yeah, yeah. I don't think anything, you know, compares to it since then. And uh, I think we just had had a blast. It was summer camp for like two or three months that we filmed over the summer. And definitely, definitely the best one. Yeah, it was pretty great. It's hard to beat. Um, obviously, you know, I love my family and I wouldn't want my wife to think that, uh, you know, my 11 year old summer was the best summer of my life. But, uh, it, it was pretty awesome, you know, hanging out with friends and having that experience and then getting to share it with uh, the rest of the world forever. It's just a, it's a pretty, a pretty amazing thing. This film represents the best of summer, the 4th of July celebrations, the carnivals, kids playing ball, the s'mores, you name it. There's so many different elements. Why do you think The Sandlot is a film that has defined summer time for a lot of people? It takes people back to, a, to an era of the United States that where kids went outside and they played and when the sun went down, that's when they came, went home. I want you to get out into the fresh air and make some friends. Run around, scrape your knees, get dirty. You had adventures during the day. It'll be 30 years next year, first of all. How does that feel for you guys? It's amazing. I mean, you know, Anytime you do a film, you never know what the results are gonna be. But to still be here talking about this 30 years later and to uh, to see it still affecting people's lives for the better is kind of, that's kind of why you're in the arts. You know, it's the, the reason that you wanna do, that's what you set out when you, you have passion about a project is to hope that you get one that, that you know, changes things, you know, forevermore. So mm -hmm. it, it's a blessing. And we, uh, we appreciate all the love and support that we've gotten over the years. What were your favorite scenes to film for each of your characters? I loved like all of the baseball stuff, obviously it was a lot of fun. When we played the other team, it was a blast. Filming the whole chase scene, we did that for like two weeks. So just the dog chasing Benny and all the different stuff. And that was a lot of fun as well. I think that there's like something to find that was cool about everything. 
And uh, even in the treehouse stuff, that treehouse was amazing. This is when they really built sets for film still. There was no green screens or, or you know, or anything like that. So that was all like real craftsmanship. Somebody, a carpenter, the, the, uh, the construction guys on set actually built those sets. So they were so cool and like so in depth, uh, Mr. Myrtle's house. And it was a really cool time in filmmaking because you still had all of the crafts really showing, you know, showcasing their work. Whereas now maybe things are a little bit more relying on, on computer generated software and, and stuff like that. So it was a cool time to, to kind of see them, you know, fabricate this, uh, this really cool film and uh, these really cool sets. Obviously my my favorite scene was going over the fence to come face to face with the beast and uh, being on that crane. And it's really cool because, you know, back then, you know, kids could do their own stunts, which would never happen nowadays. And just like a lot of the stuff that I didn't even see till the final picture came out, the 4th of July scene, you know, we filmed that with just literally lights and gels that they put in front to make it look like fireworks were going off. You know, when we filmed that, it didn't seem that iconic to me until you put Ray Charles to it, until you put the, the fireworks in the sky. And uh, you, when we saw the final product, we were like, wow, like that really like, you know, that's an amazing scene. That was just movie magic. God done shed his grace on thee. What kind of memories do people you know, tell you that they have that are related to the Sandlot. What do the fans come up to you and say? Everybody that relates to Squints that has the glasses or like, you know, I get a lot of the pictures and the photos. Sometimes as growing up, having glasses is always like a, you know, something that people could be a little reserved about or, or feel like they get picked on a little bit. So it's cool to have that that cool character that people can relate to that, that makes them feel um, like this is a, a superpower, not, not not the opposite. How do you think the Sandlot has helped empower young people to feel more included, be more inclusive, and, you know, feel okay to embrace their differences? It's awesome because this is a bunch of uh, kids of all shapes, colors, and sizes. They're all different. They all have their own little, their little thing. And, you know, the main character is a kid that's filling out a place and Andrew coming from somewhere else and really not fitting in. And it starts off with, so like, his struggle of, like, on you know, trying to connect with his stepfather and trying to connect with these kids in this but new neighborhood. And uh, it takes a guy like Benny, who is obviously a, a very strong character and an amazing baseball player and uh, a total star to just say, you know, leave him alone. We need an extra guy and this guy's, this guy's gonna be it, you know? So it's about including people regardless of, you know, what the, the masses feel. So I think it has a lot to say about, you know, real American values, because that's what America is. It's a melting pot of different cultures and different people that, that you know, find common ground to create a better life for themselves. Really cool to hear from those two. We're gonna share more from them after the break, including what it was like to film that famous pool scene featuring Squints and Wendy Peppercorn. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody good, and that's it! Yeah. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks. It's not months. Exactly. Every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Fire. 
and good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Welcome back to our special episode of Pop Star Plus. Let's pick back up with Donna Farrison's conversation with two stars from The Sandlot, Marty York and Chauncey Leopardi, who spoke about that very pivotal pool scene and the impact it's had on young kids today. Chauncey, you were talking about, you know, Wendy Peppercorn and that pool scene, which is so iconic when your character almost drowns and then gets saved by the lifeguard that everyone has a crush on. What do you remember from shooting that scene? God, he looks like a dead fish. Uh, it was really cold. Mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it was a really hot summer, but uh, during the time that we shot the pool scene, it had dipped down into like the 70s and we were shooting early mornings for the light and uh, it was freezing cold. So in a lot of those scenes, you can see us like, shivering in the pool or I know it was like a big anticipation for me leading up to that I kept asking the director you know is today the day is today the day <laughs> you know what I mean it was my first my first kissing scene so you know wow pretty exciting that is exciting that's amazing yeah. just as we talked about earlier too so much that has happened or the emotions that are evoked from the sandlot translate into real life as well. On the Today Show, Hoda recently interviewed the three boys who had saved the dad who became unconscious underwater in their pool. It's an amazing story. They performed CPR on him, saved his life, and they credited learning CPR through watching The Sandlot and through that specific scene. Now, who took a CPR class? Raise your hand. Nobody? But you did know because what was one of your favorite movies? The Sandlot. What was your reaction to that news? That's just incredible. You know, like, here we are 30 years later and, and something that someone saw that we did 30 years ago saved their father's life. I mean, it, it just, it, it makes you want to tear up because it's such a beautiful thing. And, uh, you know, wherever we get the information from, it, it's great, you know? So to be the, the the force that helped them do that for their father, you know, I, I'll never forget it. Every time I come across a fan of the Sandlot, they always talk about it in a way that, you know, they feel so comfort comforted and cozy when watching it. It brings them back to a different time. Why do you think people feel so comforted when watching the Sandlot? It's timeless. The way David Mickey Evans, the writer and director shot it, he told the DP, Tony Richmond, he told him, I want it to look like Kodak chromatic film. So that's like an old, uh, you know, very pop arty type of film from the, from the 60s. And he said, I want it to look like that. And I think because of the setting, how do you have done it in the 90s when we shot it and, and placed it present day? I don't think it would have lasted and stood the test of time. It's like a Bel Air. It's like a, a 57 Chevy, you know, it's something that the lines on it are going to be clean forever and no matter what you're always going to get a nostalgic feeling when you go see these these old cars at these car shows and just the storied time in american history and be and because it's it's just frozen in time i think that it it, it stands the test of time because it is a time capsule like marty said it just it takes you to a happy place where you know good or bad we felt like everything was was a little bit simpler Thank you to Marty and Chauncey for hanging out with us. Still to come, we've queued up some of the most nostalgic summer movie scenes of all time. Do we got any Parent Trap fans out there? Stick with us. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. 
To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it. Welcome back to our special episode of Pop Start Plus. We are diving into everything you need to know about nostalgic summer movies. And who better to guide us along than Chris Witherspoon? He is the founder and CEO of Pop Viewers, and he's about to take us on a lovely trip down memory lane with some of the most nostalgic summer movie scenes ever. Is there anything that beats the warm weather, the long sun-filled days and fun that comes with summertime? Whether you went to camp or hung out by the pool, spent time with family and friends, or had seven jobs like me, summer was always filled with terrific memories of growing up. Unfortunately, we'll never be kids again, but luckily, we'll always have movies to turn to that transport us back to those days, no matter what decade you grew up in. Let's count down as we watch some of the best nostalgic summer movie scenes of all time. First up, Weekend at Bernie's. It's an absolute classic. Now grab your sunblock and flip flops because you'll be wanting to enjoy a weekend at the beach after watching this one. In it, Jonathan Silverman and Andrew McCarthy play friends who are invited for a weekend at their boss's opulent beach house. Lots of shenanigans ensue that ultimately lead to their boss, Bernie's, death. But to avoid ruining their weekend, Richard and Larry pretend he's still alive. Let's take a look at the clip. You're probably right. Get it together, Bernie. Oh, Bernie. Here we go. Shoot, move it over a little bit, okay, baby? Asshole. I don't understand why we have to move him, Rich. Oh, don't ask me any questions, Larry. Just move him. Oh. Here we go. Ready? I can't believe I'm touching a dead body. Here's your boss. Oh. Come on. Let's go. Whoa. Oh, Bernie. <laughs> oh, what to get her up. Oh, Bernie. You're all just Come on. That's what you call some dead weight. Come on, let's go. Come on, he's crazy. Here we go. Wait, is there an award for playing the best dead guy? If so, Terry Kaiser deserves it. If you're looking to laugh like there's no tomorrow, add this film to your summer watch list. Next up, one of almost everyone's favorites, The Notebook. Ryan Gosling and Rachel McAdams killed these roles as lovers who were always meant to be together. Who could forget the moment when Noah and Ali reunited after seven years apart? Did he just pick that boat up with his bare hands? I think he did. It wasn't over for me. I waited for you for seven years. Now it's too late. I wrote you 365 letters. I wrote you every day for a year. You wrote me? Yes. It wasn't over. It still isn't over. That's a kiss right there. Ooh, talk about a hot girl summer. Even all that rain couldn't cool those two down. On to another fun one, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Now, if you watch this as a teen, then you got tons of ideas on how to spend the perfect day playing hooky. Matthew Broadwick stars, of course, as Ferris Bueller, and the movie starts a month before Ferris's high school graduation. Ferris ends up at a museum, a baseball game, a fancy restaurant, you name it. One of the most hilarious moments was when his teacher realizes he's missing from class. Let's watch this clip. Anderson. Here. Bueller. 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 Um, he's sick. My best friend's sister's boyfriend's brother's girlfriend heard from this guy who knows this kid is going with the girl who saw Ferris pass out at 31 Flavors last night. Now she can That's lie. That's pretty serious. That's a good lie. Thank you, Simone. No problem whatsoever. Fry. <laughs> oh my God. Ben Stein's boring monotone delivery gets me every time. And P.S. Find yourself a coworker that will be your alias next time you want to ditch work on a summer Friday. Everybody needs one of those. Now, Clueless is one of those timeless movies following a group of popular high school friends. If you didn't know, it's a modernization of Jane Austen's Emma, and it's got an amazing cast. Alicia Silverstone and Paul Rudd, and of course, the late, great Brittany Murphy. 
just to name a few. Check out this scene where Cher, played by Silverstone, makes the case for not participating in PE class. Earth to Cher! Come in, Cher! <laughs> oh my oh. God. Ms. Stoger, I would just like to say that physical education in this school is a disgrace. I mean, standing yes, in gym line outfits. for 40 minutes is hardly Different aerobically outfits. effective. I doubt I've worked off the calories in a stick of carefree gum. Come on, Cher. I feel like in this scene, Cher could have just said, uh, oh, as if, and been done with it. Clueless does take place throughout all four seasons, but real talk, those Beverly Hills vibes will have you feeling like you're on vacation. Another fun summer love story with lots of dancing, you guessed it, dirty dancing. Jennifer Grey and Patrick Swayze play Baby and Johnny, and the two fall in love after being paired as dance partners. Now, one of the most iconic movie lines ever came from the scene where Johnny proclaims his love for Baby before the movie's final epic dance performance. Let's watch. Nobody puts baby in a corner. Tell him. Sorry about the disruption, folks. But I always do the last dance of the season. But this year, somebody told me not to. So I'm going to do my kind of dancing with a great part. Sit down. It's not dance. only a terrific dancer. Dirty dance. Somebody who's taught me <laughs> that there are people willing to stand up for other people no matter what it costs them. Mmm. The best parts yet to come. I am declaring it now. Nobody puts baby in the corner is one of the most iconic movie lines of all time. Try to tell me it's not. Alas, if only all of our summers could end with a sultry summer dance routine. And next up, one of my favorites, Poetic Justice. Janet Jackson, Regina King, and Tupac Shakur gave legendary performances in this film. They play friends who road trip to Oakland, California, and basically fall in love along the way. Poetic Justice is another one of those films that will definitely have you crying and laughing, but I love this scene where the friends crash a random family barbecue. Let's take a look. I don't think so. My cousins, my cousins. Look at my family over here. My cousins. What's up, cousin? How you doing, boy? boy? Cousin. What's up, cousin? What's up? Well, I ain't seen you and I don't know where. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Janet Jackson knows how to give a good stank face. And sometimes all you gotta say is cousin. And you guys, I'm pleading the fifth on if I've ever crashed a barbecue for a burger. Please don't judge me. And last, but certainly not least, I doubt you've ever gone a summer without watching this one. The Parent Trap. The remake stars Lindsay Lohan and tells the story of twin sisters who meet and realize they are really sisters at summer camp. The moment they see each other and realize how much they look alike is priceless. Let's take a look. <gasps> New camp champ, come on. They look alike, that one. Those freckles, those freckles, those freckles get me every time. Why is everyone staring? <gasps> Can we have Kleenex see handy? See what? Please. I need them. This part us. gets me every time. Resemblance between you and me? Oh my God, every time that movie gets me. You know, I watched this movie so many times as a kid and you couldn't tell me Lindsay Lohan didn't have a twin sister in real life. It's definitely one to add to the rotation, y'all. Okay, we just gave you a taste of a few surefire summer flicks. Now I know we outside again, but with this summer heat, nothing beats a good old movie night. We hope you have a blast watching or re-watching some of our favorite picks. So many great recommendations. Our thanks to Chris for bringing them to us and for giving us all a boost with your terrific reactions. We should mention you can download the Pop Viewers app from the App Store. That was our Pop Start Plus Nostalgic Summer Movie Special here on Today All Day. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you had as much fun as we did revisiting some of our favorite films from the past. It's been a pleasure to bring them to you. Have a great day. The American Heart Association now considers healthy sleep patterns key to heart and brain health, and so it's now added sleep to its cardiovascular health checklist. When the association evaluated 
tens of thousands of Americans using that new criteria, it came back with a concerning number. There it is right there on your screen. 80% of people in this country have low to moderate cardiovascular health with scores that vary significantly according to age, gender, race, other factors as well. Here to help us break it all down, Dr. Jennifer Haith, cardiologist at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Dr. Haith, good morning to morning. you. Good you morning. would be hard pressed to find a more sleep deprived group of people. <laughs> I'm sure. Probably <laughs> in, in here in one night. So let's, let's start with just how many hours should we be getting every night? Clear up the confusion. So the American Heart Association has added sleep and is saying that seven to nine hours for adults is crucial to your heart health and your overall well-being. What's the connection between sleep and heart health and brain health? Because it may not be immediately apparent to folks. It's a great question, and I don't think we fully understand sleep. It's a strange phenomenon if you think <laughs> about it, but we think it's restorative. We know that when you're asleep, your heart rate slows down, your blood pressure comes down, and that's a large chunk of time for your body to be in a relaxation mode, mm. and the effects are great on high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity. I want to go back to that full screen that we just put up just a moment ago because it looks like there's all, it also varies by age as well, the amount of sleep that we should be getting. So you're saying that we should be getting between seven and nine. What about folks who are younger? What about folks who may be, may be a bit older as well? So we know that younger children need a lot of sleep and it's really important for their brain development. So for children under the age of five, we're recommending somewhere between 10 and 16 hours of sleep a, you know, a day. Uh, for kids that That'd are aging. That'd be amazing, <laughs> especially on Saturday. <laughs> exactly. Um, adolescents, you know, a little bit older, six to 12, they're recommending about nine to 12 hours. And then older children, teenagers, eight to 10. So it gets less as you get older, but it's crucial for young children to get good What sleep. about those folks, and we all know them, they're like, I only need five hours right. of sleep. I only need four or six. Okay, fine. They feel all right. Are they affecting their heart health? You know, it, that's a great question. It's hard to know. It's for sure true that some people seem to need less sleep and seem to function okay. But I think that the vast majority of people need a solid seven to nine hours if they can a night. And if they can't, then make up for it in naps. Yeah. So sleep is the newest addition to this, this checklist, this cardiovascular checklist. What else is on the list? So the list is comprised of things that, you know, are modifiable and less modifiable and need medication. So for instance, nicotine, okay. that's actually been changed this year to include non-regular cigarettes, e-cigarettes and vaping, mm. uh, sleep as we mentioned, diet, exercise, and then hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, and obesity. So if you're in that low list, you said like some things you can change, some things you can't, they're your physiology. What is your recommendation if somebody comes in and says, like, I'm, I'm worried that my heart health is not where it needs to be? Well, the good news is, and I take care of people with very advanced heart disease, there's always something you can do. You need to see your doctor once a year and be screened for all of your risk factors. You need to take prescribed medication that your doctors give you for hypertension, diabetes. You need to get exercising, and that doesn't mean you have to go into some psychotic fitness program. You know, you can just put on sneakers and walk. You know, I, I, I know quit smoking is always at the top of the list. It's so hard for folks, and I, especially people who've smoked for a long time and might think, what's the the point now it's too late the damage is done it's never too late the benefits of, of quitting smoking can be seen at any time in life and it improves with every year you quit I mean you you will see I will see patients yeah. who quit their skin their hair wow. their physique everything changes Dr. Heath, really quickly why now I mean we've known for years that you know more sleep is good for us why do they just add it decide to add it to the checklist now I think that we've realized as a community of doctors and scientists that it's really important to have relaxation as part of your overall wellness yeah. and that's becoming something that we're studying more and so I think it's really great that they've included it. All right. And I love that you're pro-nap. Yeah. I believe in the nap. I love a nap. Yes. I want, you to, is good. I want you to come to my house later and talk to my kids about the importance of sleeping 16 hours I a know. Day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, 100%. Let's get that going. Let's check in with Thank Al. You, He's Dr. on the road. He's the Energizer Bunny. How many hours of sleep do you think you get every night, Al? <laughs> I, I get about six, which I know isn't uh, enough, but you know, you, you, on the weekends it's more like eight. Yeah. Plus and you're and not the, doctor, does it have to be consecutive? It, does, does it have to be consecutive? Or does, it, does it have to be consecutive hours of sleep? I mean, they're trying to recommend that people get some sort of cons consistent yeah. length, but like I said, LeBron Gra is a big fan of the nap. Okay, oh. good. Grab it where you can. Be like LeBron, Al. Yeah. For breaking news in our changing world, Download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. If you wanted to plant a beautiful garden, you might not pick them all in L.A., but with the help of this mobile nursery called the Oasis, it might be exactly where you end up. It almost seems like she is this entrance to a secret garden that you can transport anywhere. She is just that. Um, I love the idea of the secret garden because she's very personal. Created by Barbara Lawson, the van helps her direct people to where they can meet her in the dirt. The name of her one-of-a-kind gardening therapy sessions. So you're telling me that we are going to do gardening. We are going to connect with the ground inside of a mall. Absolutely inside that mall, but not just any experience. You just wait and see. For Barbara, a certified grief counselor, the root of sharing her love of plants runs much deeper. What inspired this dream? This particular dream about uh, Meet Me in the Dirt was uh, born in pain. Um, when I was 24, I lost my mother. Normally, you can move through that process of grieving uh, naturally, but after about 20 years of not dealing with that pain, um, I went into a deep depression, and Meet Me in the Dirt was born. We joined Barbara inside her South Bay Galleria sanctuary for a therapy session and watched her transform a table of strangers into a wellspring of well-being. I start by giving you journals because, yes, we're going to get dirty, but um, this work requires that we also do some of this work, meaning reflection. We are love. Strong, strong, intentional, intentional, sincere, sincere, sunshine, sunshine grateful, and yearning. and yearning. I'm loving all these words. So right behind you, and then take whatever time you need, there's an assortment of plants. I want you to get two babies that call your name. Exactly like my daughter. Oh, okay. <laughs> this looks like a crazy hair. Yes. Yeah. That's <laughs> cool. No plan is perfect unless it's fake. There is absolutely scientific proven facts that show us that digging in dirt releases stress, releases anxiety, and it helps us to heal. You have your pen, you have your journal. What is this good soil getting ready to represent in your life? Think about this nursery pot. What would happen if this baby stayed in this nursery pot? Your new environment is where you're gonna allow yourself to grow and to flourish beyond where you were. So sometimes in life, things have to come against you. Press, press all around. What is it that's doing that to you? What's squeezing you on all sides? As we worked through the session, it became obvious that the dirt symbolizes so much more. When I placed my first baby in the pot, she was leaning over and I wanted her to stand up. <laughs> and I had to check myself in that moment and say, it's okay for her to lean. It's okay for her to get steadied over time. And it's very, very parallel to some personal things that I'm dealing with right now. So I'm trying to hold it together. <laughs> but it's deeper. When she was talking about how some of the leaves, this is the plant's way of, of shedding the toxicity. Yeah. Do you see beauty in that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there's beauty in the growth, there's beauty in the shedding. When you look at it knowing what the plant's doing, all of a sudden it becomes beautiful. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It reminds you of yourself. In cheering, you actually become a very powerful person. Yes. That's right. Yes. And you're so afraid to be vulnerable, mm -hmm. when being vulnerable is actually incredible. And for an hour, we listen to the wisdom found in Mother Nature from a gardener of plants and a gardener of people.
even when you were moving yourself out of that old nursery pot mm -hmm. into your new environment, you just transitioned. We've connected with each other. We've shown each other love. We've added encouragement. Mm -hmm. We've made sure to tell ourselves that nothing blooms all year round. It's such uh, an emotional experience. I still think about some of the things she said. No plant is perfect uh, unless it's fake. And I gotta admit, at the beginning of that piece, you hear me, uh, her, you hear her tell me, uh, yeah, just, just you wait and see about this experience. I was extremely skeptical. We were heading into a mall. I did not expect to find these ancient and primal truths. And yet there they were. And Barbara says the best part about this is that they're all there for anyone that's willing to get their hands a little dirty. Mm. Yeah, guys. I love that. That was great, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. Who <laughs> will meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time? When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Who will meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time? When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Don Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The ability to get outside and to be physically active during this time was frankly indispensable for our emotional health. Mike Varley and Jesse Hyatt of Brooklyn, New York had always made a hobby out of getting their steps in. We decided to walk from San Diego to LA, which is 120 miles. We did the length of Vermont and we went from the Pacific Ocean to Olympia, Washington. But during the COVID-19 pandemic, they stepped up their game. I pitched to Jesse this crazy idea that we walk five marathons a week for one calendar year around New York City. Driven by a desire to challenge themselves mentally and physically, the couple began walking 26.2 miles a day, multiple times a week, starting in June 2020. I have been working in the fashion and textile industry. She had her business and still uh, managed to walk three days a week and uh, I walked the five days a week for the one calendar year. Mike leaving his job at a video game company to dedicate himself full time to the project. Before they hit the pavement, the two spending 18 months planning everything from their routes to meals to their outfits. This was a full time job. How did you financially support yourselves? When I worked at the video game company, a large portion of my responsibility was tracking the budget. I have some good spreadsheet skills. Part of the 18 months was making sure that we saved up enough money to do this comfortably. So, to take me through a typical walk. The average day was nine and a half hours. And the first three months, what we were doing was hitting every neighborhood in New York City. And uh, after we started doing a bunch of themed walks, we did one that was famous, Brooklyn female vocalists and the high schools they went to, uh, which was great. It really ran the gamut. Over the course of the year, Mike and Jesse logged 7,000 miles documenting their journey on their YouTube channel and podcast. 
They say the benefits went well beyond calories burned. If I have a slight pain in my calf, that will go away. If I have that thought that's really making me feel nervous or uncomfortable, that will also go away. And it really was interesting just how the physicality of it um, mirrored and paralleled the mental um, experience. So how, how did you guys change physically? I think I lost somewhere between 15 and 20 pounds. Something that was uh, the most affirming for me was that I still had like a little bit of uh, belly fat going on at the end of the, the whole thing. If you're walking 7,000 miles and you still have a little bit of belly fat, uh, maybe your body's okay. You know, like my body is what it is. The walks pushed Jesse and Mike to make discoveries about themselves and each other. I have the ability to conquer challenges and, and know that difficult experiences won't be forever. I learned that I'm definitely with the right person. This project is so special to us and so important. So we ended up inviting our friends and family to join us for parts of our final marathon. And we got married in Marine Park at the very end of the marathon. It was honestly one of the best days of my life. What would you say to somebody who's thinking, I'd like to do something like this? It's just one step at a time. It doesn't need to be 26.2 miles each day. That is extreme. You can walk around your block. It could be one mile a day. It's just getting out and feeling the air and feeling the pavement or the grass under your feet. It's such a game changer. It feels so good. Oh. You hear that story, you feel like a slacker. I know. <laughs> Every day. Every day. I'm there Every, day. Every miles day. Do you walk a day? Um, I try to get three anywhere between three and five. Okay. But, uh, that this is taking it to a whole new level. <laughs> In fact, last week uh, Jesse and Mike celebrated their first anniversary, and they celebrated by, of course, going on a marathon anniversary walk. Yes. Their very first since they completed the challenge. And if you're wondering what they ate along the way, the answer is a New York City classic bagels. Oh, uh, Mike taking up a side project to uh, uh, of these walks, raiding bagels all across the city. No way. He tried 202 different bagel stores. His top rated is P&C Bagels Ooh. out in Middle Village, Queens. I know that bagel shop. That's not too far That's from where I'm from. That's good bagels, like yeah, the big, really fat yeah. New York City no, bagels? Not, not as fat. The, the, hmm. the big, fat one, the tires one. Yeah. It's not the, t the real okay. New York City bagel. Welcome back. If you're feeling burnt out or not exactly where you'd like to be in life, our next guest has an important message for you. Jenna Kutcher is the creator and host of the top-rated podcast, The Gold Digger. She's also out with a new book, How Are You Really? Living Your Truth, One Answer at a Time. Jenna, good morning. Thank How are you really? I am so good. You know, I feel like right now the women are just really understanding that they haven't asked themselves that question. Yep. And it's time to get honest with ourselves about are we enjoying life are we faking it how do we get back to like feeling that passion again I so. know, you know even if things are okay there's a way that we can all get into kind of autopilot absolutely you know we're not in crisis thankfully we're not having an explosion of excitement it's just every day how yeah. do we live a more fulfilling life yeah I really feel like we have to understand that no one can plan our lives for us anymore we have to take control and if I can do it as a small town Minnesota mom of two under four and go from working from Target to working from home and building a business and teaching other people how to do it we've got to figure out how we can take control of our lives and our joy you have several questions that are quite thought-provoking yeah. that kind of jump start this thinking what is one of the questions do you think we should be asking ourselves? Yeah. When is the last time we felt joy? Mm. I feel like we are starving for joy these days, and it's like we want to find these glimpses of joy in our lives. And so when was the last time we felt joy? Yeah, what, and the, what's the next one? I would say, what do you want to do with your lives? Like, where are you at, and where do you want to go, and how does your day-to-day -day reflect that future that you want for yourself? Yeah, I, I was reading something in your book that was it really hit me. You said, um, if you wrote down or recorded everything that you say to yourself yes. out loud, would you be proud yes. of that inner dialogue? Yeah. You know, so many of our inner dialogues are handed down from well-intentioned people, whether it's political or our parents or society. And I think a lot of times we don't rewrite the narratives in a way that expresses who we are and what our truth is. You know, it would be interesting, actually, as an exercise to write it down. Yes. Because a lot of times those that it's background noise. We don't even realize how we may be 
berating ourselves or, or, or talking down, you know, our hopes and dreams. All that, you could never do that. It's too late for this. It's too yes. late for that. Yeah. You know, the world is so noisy these days that we've started to just tune out our own inner intuition. So it's like, how do we come back home to ourselves? But how do we also get brutally honest if our lives aren't full of joy? How do we figure out what it is that we want to do? And that's why I'm so excited to guide people through that journey. And then last but not least, loneliness. So many people feel that, especially after the pandemic, a lot of us really lost that sense of community. Yeah. What's your best advice? There's a line in my book that says, loneliness isn't being in isolation. Loneliness is being seen, but not fully known. Mm. And so I really think that it's time that we really claim back our narratives and like control what we want for our futures and start to move in the direction of our dreams. All right, Jenna, so much. The book is chock full of good advice. Carson Daly loves yeah. it. He yes. I love it. Shout out on the way over. Love it. The podcast is The Gold Digger. You can check it out. And the book, How Are You Really, is out now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now to our series, Donna Talks, where our girl Donna sits down for some candid conversations with folks from all walks of life. And today's roundtable is a timely one, especially as we celebrate Pride Month. Yes, it is. We gather together a few people from the LGBTQ community across generations who shared their own personal stories of identity, acceptance, and resilience. And I wanted to give them a platform to share their truth. Take a look. During the month of June, millions of Americans are celebrating Pride. In 2021, 20.8% of Gen Z Americans who have reached adulthood identified as LGBTQ+, which has nearly doubled since 2017. So how has modern LGBTQIA identity transformed? We wanted to ask the questions and most importantly, listen, along with Jody Patterson, an author, activist, and mom to a trans teenage son who is the inspiration behind a children's book, Sam Ames, the Director of Advocacy and Government Affairs at the Trevor Project, who identifies as non-binary and transmasculine, and 70-year-old lesbian couple Paulette and Pat Martin, whose paths brought them together six years ago. Let's get to talking. When did you declare your identity? Honestly, I'm not sure I did. Um, there, there absolutely was a moment late in life when I needed to uh, explain to people what was going on. But for most of my life, I just sort of was who I was. It was very clear from a very young age that I was not like a girl. For me, it wasn't about choosing a box. It was about taking the lid off and living in the light. Jody, I see you nodding your head a lot. And tell me about your experience as a mom to Pinnell. At three, Penel, at the time Penelope said to me the most unbelievable words, Mama, I'm not a girl, I'm a boy. My child knew who he was early on. I had to catch up. Pat and Paulette, you two came out later in life. I knew that I did not fit into any category that was being presented to me. I'm going to stuff it down. I'm going to ignore the feelings. I was married, so I ceased being myself and becoming cold and bitter and not sharing the deepest part of my heart 
not even truly with my children. When you came out, what did you gain? Myself. I actually knew that I was interested in women at the age of five. Mm -hmm. My mother was totally homophobic. So I was suppressing the feeling. At the age of 17, when I graduated from school, I handed my grandmother my diploma, went into the bathroom, took off the last dress I ever wore, put on my suit. I was such an angry young person because I couldn't be who God had made me to be. Sam, I know that you've spoken a lot about how kids these days have more language than you did growing up. As someone who identifies as non-binary and transmasculine, can you explain those terms a little bit in that vocabulary? Non-binary is essentially a recognition that, like most things on this earth, gender is a spectrum. There are many, many layers and nuances between. There is this beautiful reclaiming possible when we create more language, when we, when we acknowledge that this language has power. People don't want to make a mistake, so they choose silence. What should someone do if they misuse a pronoun or misgender someone if they make a mistake? Apologize and keep it moving. <laughs> That's right. I'm trans and I still slip up on pronouns. You're going to mess up sometimes. Move on with respect and love and you get better over time. What have you noticed about the similarities and differences between Gen Z, your generation, older generations? Trans and non-binary young people say that um, having just one person or a few people in their life respect their pronouns decreases their suicide risk by as much as 50%. That is enormous. It is an easy, easy thing. What? is something that everyone can do, whether you are in the LGBTQ plus community or not, that can educate, inform, and support. We need to be listening to those who are different from us, and we need to be asking the questions. How can I be an ally? It is not to probe into someone's life. It is to assert that you are on the right side of things, that you want to be a part of the solution. Have more conversations, attend more events, keep your mouth closed, ears open. There's this concern that it's a fad or it's trendy or something. I want to say, there have always been exactly the same number of LGBTQ people in any given society as there are now. What we have now is language to describe it. What do you want the younger generation to know about your experience? Be but, proud. Yeah. Be proud of who you are. Live proudly 365 days a year. Mm. 365 what days a, a year. That's so conversation. It's really amazing. Important. For more stories like this, head to today.com slash pride. And I hope you do. And really, really awesome. A Hold big honor attention. for two Olympic legends. This is well deserved. Swimming icon Michael Phelps and skiing legend Lindsey Vaughn were among those inducted into the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Hall of Fame. And both athletes delivered speeches that were reflective and personal. My biggest journey now is the mental health world. I cannot wait to really uncover, uncover and open more paths, not only for everybody else in the world, but especially for our teammates and our athletes here at the USOPC. I would like to dedicate this to my mother. She's having her own battle right now with the ALS. And she's taught me so much about strength and character. Mm. Mm. I'm glad that she yeah. mentioned, you know, a lot of the, the folks mentioned their parents yes. and, the, you know, the folks you think about before, before they get to the Olympics, there are practices at four, oh, five, yes. six years yeah. old. You know, we've talked to athletes who slept in their cars oh. on the way with their parents, yeah. certain practices. So, uh, well, well deserved for them. And in fact, other inductees include figure skater Michelle Kwan, soccer star Mia Hamm, and tennis legend, certainly well deserved, Billie Jean King. Billie wow. Jean King's one of those you kind of, you kind of think was. Why well, was she? Yeah. yeah. She she probably should have been sooner, but that was... hey, better late than better yeah, late than absolutely. ever.
Buongiorno today all day. Who doesn't love Italian food? Well, up next on Hashtag Cooking, Saba is putting her own spin on two classic Italian dishes. First, a crispy breaded eggplant that's baked, not deep fried, and gluten-free. Then she whips up a vegan version of a classic pasta dish. Oh, yeah, manja. So when I said cacio e pepe, really, I meant cashew e pepe. Huh? Am I the only one who loves at my own jokes? <laughs> All hail Italian food. I love it. Some traditional Italian dishes do have a lot of dairy, so I wanted to create some of my favorites with a plant-based twist. Today I'm going to show you how to make a breaded eggplant that uses almond meal instead of breadcrumbs in a really delicious and creamy vegan cacio e pepe. This is hashtag Sama's Italian. Eggplant is a vegetable I kind of tend to forget about the second it enters my kitchen. So, to use up all of my forgotten eggplant that I've been finding in my fridge, I wanted to create something that had the breading of an eggplant parm, but the snackability of something like a slice of bruschetta. So, enter my breaded eggplant. The first thing that we're gonna do is slice our eggplant. Got a cute eggplant here. Just gonna trim the end off. And start slicing. Here's a little tip. You don't actually need to salt your eggplant. Traditionally, you'd salt your eggplant to get rid of that bitterness, but nowadays, the bitterness has been bred out of eggplant. I'm slicing my eggplant into little slices that are about a quarter of an inch thick. Perfect. So happy I'm using up my forgotten eggplant. It's just been sitting in there for so long. Okay. I'm gonna let my eggplant hang out here while I make my little egg mixture. I wanted my breading to have a lot of flavor on its own, so in addition to my almond meal, I'm gonna add some of my favorite spices. I'm using almond meal or unblanched almond flour for this recipe, which still keeps the skin on the almonds. I find that this is really nice to add texture and it's a great replacement for breadcrumbs. The cayenne is gonna add a little heat and the turmeric and cumin are my favorite pairing. We cannot forget our salt and pepper. What is life without some salt and pepper? It'd be very unseasoned and boring. Little salt. And some freshly ground black pepper. I like that the turmeric is also gonna add some nice yellow color to this eggplant. Just gonna whisk this until it's nice and well combined. I want the breading to be really flavorful, and so I'm mixing it super well so no piece of eggplant goes unseasoned. That would be really sad. Also super bold of me to wear a white shirt when I'm using turmeric. This is how I live on the edge, okay? Beautiful. The breading is happy, now time to beat an egg. We want to whisk the egg until it's completely uniform. We don't want any separation between the yolk and the white. This looks nice and uniform. A perfect little bath for my eggplant. Now it's time to assemble. This eggplant has really been on a journey from being forgotten in the fridge to going down the line to flavor. I mean, lucky eggplant though. We want to dip it straight in this egg mixture. Make sure it's really well coated. Now we don't want any excess egg on the eggplant, so I'm just gonna let it drip out just like this. We want a really nice and even coating of the breading, which is why we're doing this. And now we're gonna put it straight into our breading. Into the parchment paper we go. Now we're just gonna repeat. This is a way better fate for your eggplant than the trash, I'm just saying. Last one, getting a little emotional. Don't worry about those guys though, I promise I will bread them later. We are ready for the oven. Look at those colors, look so pretty. 
I'm popping these in at 375 degrees for 30 minutes. Make sure to flip them halfway through. I think we all need to take a moment just to look at the color alone. Look at that yellow from the turmeric, the little golden crispness on the edges. I'm like drooling already, I really can't wait to eat them. These are perfect on their own, honestly, because they have so much flavor in the breading, but I love to use them as a vehicle for my toppings of choice. This could be a bruschetta, this could be a pesto, even just a little tahini drizzle with some salt is so good. Today, I'm gonna use a bruschetta and a pesto. By the way, you can make your own for sure, but if you wanna buy store-bought too, totally fine with me. Again, what a bold choice of me to cook with turmeric and wear white. Like, I love taking risks. Okay, I'm gonna add some pesto. Spread that on really nicely. These would make a great app or a side at your next party, or even if you're just partying by yourself. They'd make a great appetizer for you. That's fine. We love that. We love a party of one. These are even good dipped in some marinara sauce, just keeping it super simple. There's so much you can do with them. They taste good with basically everything. For my bruschetta. And because everything is better with a little salt, gonna add some flaky sea salt on top. It's gonna taste really good, it's gonna add a little bit more saltiness, but it's also gonna look really pretty too. Just a little. You know, this eggplant, this middle one, it's not sure what it wants, so it's gonna get both. <laughs> Whoever gets this piece, that's the lucky person at the party. <laughs> I'm cracking myself up, okay. Uh. Okay, great. Can't forget a little salt on here. This screams, you need to take a picture of me. So I'm gonna listen. And again, feel free to use whatever toppings you want. This is truly very customizable to your liking and your flavor inclination. Or whatever you see at the store that you're like, mm, that looks good, I'm gonna put that on my breaded eggplant. I support you. Even hummus, I just thought of that. Even hummus, that's what I'm gonna top this with next time. Okay, I for sure got the shot. I got like 15, to be real with you. So now I'm gonna try one. Okay, I'm gonna go for it with this little guy right here. Okay, I'm ready, I hope you're ready. Mm, so good. I'm serving this at my next party. Even if it's just me, I'm just gonna serve it to myself. I deserve it. This was so yummy. And look what we created. The colors of an Italian flag. I mean, come on, look at that. So cute. a question. Are you dairy free and miss the glory days of really creamy cheesy pastas? Well, you're in luck because my next recipe, my vegan cacio e pepe, has you completely covered. I'm gonna go get the ingredients. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> Global media Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this?
opened the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Kachoe Pepe is one of those dishes that everyone is obsessed with. But if you can't tolerate dairy, it's probably not high on your list. Don't worry though, I'm going to change that because this vegan cachoe pepe is truly going to blow your mind. First up, we're going to make our cashew parmesan. And yes, I did say cashew parmesan. To make this parm, we're using a base of cashews, raw cashews, and nutritional yeast for that savory, nutty, cheesy flavor. I'm going to start by adding my raw cashews into my blender. Make sure your cashews are raw and unsalted. Now for our nutritional yeast. Nutritional yeast is commonly used as a vegan cheese substitute because it's got this savory, nutty, cheesy flavor. A little bit of umami in there too. Make sure you buy the fortified version because that's the one that has a lot of vitamins and minerals. Now we need some spices. We've got to have a little seasoning. So, got some salt. Salt going in. And some garlic powder. Now, all we're gonna do, because my blender is truly my best friend, is blend it all up. Be careful though not to overblend. We just wanna blitz it a little bit so we get a nice fine powder, sort of like a Parmesan. And that's perfect, that took less than 10 seconds. Let me show you what it looks like. It smells so good, it's cheesy, it's nutty, it's savory. It's kind of like a nice fine powder, perfect for sprinkling on top of pasta. This makes a little bit more than I'll need for this recipe, so you can totally store this in the fridge for up to a week. Top your popcorn with it, some salads, it's very versatile. And you know what? I'm gonna make my sauce in this blender too, so I'm just gonna transfer this out, keep it over here, don't have to wash any more dishes. I'm being lazy today and that's okay. I still love myself. This is some hashtag precious Parmesan. Can't waste any of it. So the reason I'm starting with the Parmesan is because the Parm is dry. The sauce is gonna be more creamy and liquidy. So that's why we're doing it in this order. Saving us some time, saving us some washing dishes. Now I'm done with my cashew Parm. Time to make the sauce. I'm using soaked cashews to create this sauce. It's gonna make it really creamy, really luscious. When you soak cashews in water, it actually becomes a little bit more pliable and easy to just blend to very delicious sauces and fillings. Just soak them for an hour in hot water. Now I'm just gonna add them to my blender. Come on, you can do it. Because cashews are super buttery, they're really rich, I want something a little acidic and tangy to sort of balance that out. Fresh lemon juice, always. Now I'm gonna add my garlic. I'm using raw garlic here because I want that really punchy flavor. For that really nutty, savory, cheesy flavor, I'm gonna add some nutritional yeast into my sauce. Just adding some salt. And listen, this is a cachoe e pepe, after all. So we have to add some pepper. Freshly ground pepper, always. We want that bite, we want it to be really peppery and delicious and be sharp as well. Whenever I make this recipe, I skip my workout. This is it right here. A lot of pepper is necessary. I'm gonna finish it off with some extra virgin olive oil. And then to help the blender move, I'm just gonna add a little bit of water just to get the blender going. You may need to add more water later, but just check the texture of the sauce and then add more as you see fit. It's time to blend. I'm gonna add a little bit more water. 
I mean, it smells so cheesy already. <gasps> I'm in love. Just a little. <gasps> it looks so good. Sorry, that was a little dramatic. I have to show you this texture. I'm gonna give it one more good blend. Every time I make this recipe, I've made it so many times, but I'm always so shocked by how creamy it is without any of the dairy. It's magic. Mmm, it's so good. I don't think it needs anything. Oh my God. Good for me. Okay, let me show you this texture. Oh, it's so peppery. It's like spicy almost, but still super savory and nutty. I love this so much. All right. Can't leave any sauce behind. I love a blender pasta sauce. It's so easy. Throw together, minimal prep, minimal ingredients. Look at how creamy and luscious that is. Sauce is done. Now I'm gonna go cook my pasta. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at seven on NBC News Now. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello. Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> Ali Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now it's time to cook our pasta. I've already got my water boiling. And don't forget, we must salt our pasta water. Hashtag no bland pasta. It's not good. Okay, the water is ready for my pasta. Just so you know, most dry store-bought pastas are vegan, so if you're looking for that, great. But make sure you do check the label to make sure the variety you're choosing is. I'm using a vegan and gluten-free chickpea pasta. There's a lot of really great bean alternative pastas out these days, and I like testing all of them out. Let's talk about pasta shape. I am using a spaghetti here as an ode to the original. We've changed a lot of things already, but you know what? We're keeping it OG when it comes to the spaghetti, but you can use your favorite shape. I'm a helicopter pasta parent. <laughs> you really do have to keep watching your pasta, especially if you're using an alternative pasta, like a bean pasta, because if you overcook those for too long, it'll become a little gummy. Pasta is such a comfort food. In my household growing up, my parents would just alternate between making Indian food and pasta. 
That was like, <laughs> that was all we had. It was Indian food or pasta. All right, I'm feeling good about this one. We're done. We're done. Woo! Here's what I want to do. I want to save some of that starchy water for later to add to the sauce and pasta to help thicken it and bind it. So I'm going to save some of that. Just a little for later. I love being prepared. And now I'm just going to use my tongs and transfer my pasta to my dish. And then I'm just going to mix the sauce all up. I'm really excited about it. This also keeps the starchy water on the pasta. It doesn't have far to go. Spaghetti is so cute. I love it. All pasta is cute. I don't discriminate. I love all pasta. You know what time it is. It's sauce time. Remember this? Remember our old friend, our cacio e pepe sauce from earlier? It's about to meet the pasta of its dreams. Now I'm just gonna add a touch of that pasta water just to help everything mix and combine, get really nice and creamy. Helps the sauce adhere to the pasta. Toss it together. Get the sauce around every single little bit of that spaghetti. It'd be sad if we didn't. And now, time for our cashew parmesan. Ready? I'm gonna mix some in and I'm gonna add some on top as well, just for a little bit of flavor, a little bit of aesthetics. Just like a traditional cacio e pepe, we wanna eat this immediately. We want it to stay hot, stay fresh. So I'm gonna serve this to myself right now. Is this generous? I don't care. Am I just like, are my eyes too big for my stomach? No, 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 you'll want to eat this much, I promise. Okay. I'm gonna cut myself off there. And now, let me just make this look a little pretty with my fork. Twirl this around. And add a little bit of my cashew parm. And by a little bit of my cashew parm, I meant a lot bit of my cashew parm. And, the dish wouldn't be complete without it. Some freshly ground black pepper. <laughs> okay, I have a vision. I have a vision for a really cute fork twirl photo. I'm gonna work on that. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna do a video. I'm gonna do a video today. That's what's, that's what's happening. Okay, ready? Okay, we got the shot. We got it. We got it. And you know what I also got? The perfect little spiral for me to eat. I'm going for it. Mmm. It is so creamy. Like, I want you to know, this is so creamy. It's cheesy. You've got layers of flavor, right? You've got the buttery cashew is creating this really creamy sauce. The black pepper makes it peppery, woody. It's got the sharp bite. And then that salty cashew parm, which I'm just gonna add more of for fun, really ties everything together. You really won't believe there's no dairy in this, I promise. Mmm. Oh, and that garlic, though? That fresh garlic, it's so punchy. Makes it smell really good, makes it taste really good. Someone needs to hold me back because I'll keep talking about this for the whole day. <laughs> this is so delicious. I love creating these really fun plant-based twists on traditional Italian food. It's unique, it's fun, it's inventive, and it's super delicious. Oh, hey.
Wait, I didn't see you there. But I'm so glad you're here because I have something I want to tell you. Hashtag cooking is back with all new episodes and I'm so excited to share my favorite recipes with you. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to go really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at eight on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. This avocado cream pasta is literally one of my most popular recipes on my blog, and I honestly think it's because you just need a blender to make this super luxurious sauce. So, the base of it is our avocados. I'm using an avocado and a half for this recipe. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with that. All right. We're gonna scoop some of this avocado out. Look at how ripe and pretty that is. Go straight in there. This avocado is what's gonna add that super creamy element to this pasta. Now I'm gonna move on to my lemon, adding the juice of one full lemon in here. Make sure I catch all the seeds. This lemon is gonna really make it tart and acidic and bring out that zing, make it very bright and fresh. I'm gonna add some fresh basil and raw garlic. Yes, I'm using raw. It's gonna be really punchy and really bright. And I love garlic. There we go. A little bit of olive oil, just a bit. And now I'm gonna season it to taste with some salt, pepper, and red pepper flakes. Salt in there. Add as much chili flakes as you'd like. I love spice, so I'm going in with a lot. But you make your own choices, okay? Now, just to help everything get moving in the blender, we're gonna add a little bit of cold water. Make sure it's cold because we don't wanna brown the avocado a bit and I can add more and adjust to get it to the right consistency that I like. Now it's time to blend. Perfect. It is so luxe, you will not even believe it. Look at that. So creamy. Before I add this creamy sauce to my pasta, I'm gonna grab one more thing. Just grab some arugula from the fridge. I love adding this to this pasta because it gives this really nice peppery bite to it. All right, time to assemble. Got my sauce, gonna add this into my pasta. You might think you put cream in this, but you didn't, I promise. I'm gonna add my tomatoes. Just a little burst of something sweet in with this avocado cream sauce. Now I'm just gonna mix in my arugula. What's great about this pasta as well is that you can eat it immediately, but you can also refrigerate it to have as a pasta salad the next day. We love a leftover. We love a meal prep situation. Is that too much? There's never too much. <laughs> what is a portion? <laughs> Some freshly ground black pepper and a pinch of flaky sea salt. And that is it. But one last thing. I can't forget to take a photo. I didn't do all of this for nothing. I love this. I'm gonna frame this. I'm gonna put this on my wall. Okay, here I go. Gotta get some arugula, some pasta in there. Okay. I love myself. <laughs> 
It's so creamy, you honestly would never know that there's no cream or butter in this. It's crazy. Hey everyone and welcome to our August Read with Jenna book club discussion. I'm so excited to be here to talk with you about our latest book club pick, The Many Daughters of Ah Fong Moy. And I'm so thrilled to have Jamie Ford, the author of this thoughtful and profound novel, joining us. I can't wait to learn more about how he developed the concept for this moving story and to share it with all of you all. Jamie, I'm so happy I'm you're thrilled here. thrilled to be here. And it's this is know, fantastic. Let's start with Ah Fong. Okay. Yeah. Ah Fong was a real mm -hmm. person. Um, talk about how you came about to learn about her and why you wanted to create a story with her really at the center. Yeah, I mean, curiously enough, I heard about Afong in the early 90s in a newspaper article for Asian American Heritage Month. Mm -hmm. It was like a calendar of all these important things that happened in this country. And there was a mention of Afong Moy, the first Chinese woman in America takes the stage in 1834. And I had tucked that into the attic of my mind for years. And as I became a, a writer of historical fiction, I always wanted to do something with her story. But her story, in all likelihood, ends in tragedy. And I wanted to give uh, her a, a bit of redemption. I couldn't figure out how to do that. And it wasn't until I began going down the rabbit holes of epigenetics and... Um, I combined the two, and by exploring her ancestors, giving her fictional ancestors, I could not only give her a voice, but I could redeem her a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in fact, it's so interesting because you say, you know, you're a writer of historical fiction, yeah. and this does have some historical fiction aspects, but it also has speculative fiction yeah. because this book is so epic in scale. It spans the years of 1836, is that mm -hmm. right? To 20... 45. 45, okay, yeah. good. So, I mean, that is wild. Did you, have you ever, <laughs> have, did you ever think about the fact that this book would scan so many years? I had, I had actually hoped that at some point in my career, I would, I would blend genres. I would, I, I like historical fiction, but I'm, I'm shackled to the past. I'm shackled to reality. And by jumping ahead into the future, it's unwritten and I can just take it anywhere I want to go. So the book, I tend to call this book my big box of crayons because <laughs> it has a lot going on. And I like the fact that it's historical, it's speculative, has some magical realism. Um, it just allowed me a, a giant blank canvas in which to tell the story. Did it feel like your your most ambitious work yet? Oh, yeah. I, t I tied my brain into <laughs> knots. I about halfway through, you know, the the construction of this book, I had just moments of. I mean, writers were creatures of insecurity, <laughs> and I was, you know, I was just like a textbook case of like, oh, I don't know if I can stick the landing. I don't know if I can pull this <laughs> off. What have I attempted to do? Um, and even after. The book was sold to my publisher, and obviously people were saying good things about it. I, it was only like yesterday before I went on this show. I'm like, I think, I think I'm starting to believe this book's going to be okay. Like, <laughs> oh, okay, I believe it now. Because it is ambitious, and you do yeah. tackle something that we discussed earlier on on our show, which is epigenetics. Yeah, you mentioned it. I did. I know a lot of people watching probably are like, what is that? Yeah. Talk talk about what it is and how you decided to kind of weave it into this <laughs> story with all of these powerful, awesome women. Yeah, I mean the the longer term is transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, uh, or boiled down to epigenetics. Um, there's been a bunch of studies, whether there's studies of the descendants of Civil War prisoners, mm. uh, pregnant women uh, during 9-11, and uh, you know, 20 years later, their children are grown up, and we're looking at their health outcomes and mental health outcomes and how they are different from the mean mm -hmm. average of society. Um, to things, tests that they did in laboratory environments that showed that one, the trauma inflicted on one set of lab animals, sorry, lab yeah, animals, yeah. Um, was manifest five generations later. Animals that had never experienced that yeah, trauma, they inherited that. that. Oh, just a little yeah, bit, yeah, because yeah. It's, it's, I read about it and it's very it's, interesting. It's kind of a, it's a, it's a moment that you want to process in yeah. the context of your own family. Um, the study was done at Emory University in 2013. They took lab animals, in this case mice. They electrified the floor as they introduced a citrus fragrance. 
again, sorry, mice. Yeah. Um, and they quickly habituated the mice to whenever they smelled that, they would have a panic fear reaction. And then they found out two, three, four, five generations later, the descendants of that original set of laboratory animals who had never been shocked, never smelled that fragrance, when they were exposed to that scent, they had the same reaction. panic fear reaction. And when you think about that, you think about your own family, the, the, what your forebears went through. Um, I always say the greatest generation had the toughest childhood, but even beyond that, and then, I mean, there's always that moment as a parent, and you're a parent, I'm mm -hmm. a parent, where you see your child and you go, that's my grandma. Yeah. You know, you have and those moments. And you've seen that. Oh, for sure. In my own family, um, whether it's my son <laughs> echoing the same dubious musical taste as, as me. <laughs> Wait, as a, so tell, oh. in, the, in the prologue of your, um, or in the, uh, yeah, yeah, the, in the, my uh, author's note author's or something. Author's note, you, you write about <laughs> a very interesting story of your son and Van Halen. Yes, yes, my, uh, my son and Van Halen. <laughs> um, my son, uh, he's a musician now, uh, he was 12. We'd been listening to pretty much nonstop Radio Disney as parents do. <laughs> And he came up to me and he's a 12 year old kid. He's like, dad, have you heard of this band called Van Halen? And I'm like, I have, where have you heard about them? And he found them on YouTube and just decided they were the best band of all time. Became obsessed with Van Halen. At first I was like, hey, what videos are you watching? There's some bikinis and stuff going on. And it wasn't, it was just, it was just the, the music. You know, yeah, the, the, the music. And my first concert, was Van Halen. Mm -hmm. And he it, didn't know that. He did not know that. Yeah. And then he later became obsessed with Genesis. And that was, you know, the, the band with Peter Gabriel, mm -hmm. with Phil Collins. Mm -hmm. And that was another band I was into as a kid. And it was one of those moments where you do kind of think maybe this is just a, a parent-child coincidence. Um, or if we're all living in a simulation, the programmers, they're, <laughs> they're just press repeat <laughs> with the next generation. But the more I looked at all my children, like I... Not only, like, I, I found, finally found a photo of my great-grandfather, mm. and his name was Men Chung, came to this country in the 1860s. We look identical, but the arts run through my family as, as well. His son worked in Hollywood for years. My dad was a fine artist. I make my living as a writer. Both my sons are musicians, uh, and one of my daughters is, an, is a visual artist. Um, she's a, actually a, a, tattoo, ta a tattoo artist, artist I should say. Tattoo. Right there. There we go. Very for the camera. Cool. Maddie, it's all about you right there. Very cool. Um, um, and so part of it's environment, but I think more than we realize is genetic. That being stated, that's really cool and interesting, but most of the studies about trauma focus on pain and suffering and the, the things that are so visible. But as an author, I wanted, and also just a sentimental guy, I wanted to know we, we must inherit other things, yes. um, resiliency and the ability to love other people, yes. uh, emotional IQs. Um, and so I wanted to explore uh, not just the trauma, but the beneficial things. And that's why I call the book my epigenetic love story. Okay, hold that thought, Jamie. We'll, we're gonna take a break and we'll come right back. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky, to cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not gonna have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at seven on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky, to cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You started with Ah Fong. 
you thought about what her life must have been yeah. like. So tell a little bit about what it was like and then what she must have passed down to oh, all yeah. the daughters that yeah. came after her. Yeah, poor Afong. I mean, she's a complex, complex woman. She came to this country. Um, she toured up and down the eastern seaboard from Buffalo, New York to Cuba. People paid money to see her perform in theaters, to sold out shows. She was written about in 200 plus newspapers. Um, she, she was a sensation. And it's interesting in, in this time, in this age, we live in an attention economy. People want to be famous. They want to be an influencer on TikTok. And, and fame is something that people seek. And she obviously was famous, but she had no autonomy of her own life. She never spoke through her own voice. She spoke through the voice of her promoters who had monetized her otherness. Yeah. She came to this country alone, a stranger in a strange land. She was celebrated, but at the time, Chinese women couldn't leave China. And if they returned, the punishment was death. So it's not likely she was here as this intrepid world traveler like Nellie Bly or yeah. as a cultural ambassador. It's most likely she was sold into this life. And her, the last anyone hears about her is a mention of her 1849, mentioning that this once famous woman is living in a poorhouse in New Jersey. Mm. And she had bound feet, so obviously her her ability and capability was severely limited. And her her life must have just been this, you know, this perpetual yeah. abandonment, long sickness, or homesickness, just yeah. this perpetual sadness. And through each generation, those those traumatic events ripple, but each generation is able to process them differently and find their way, hopefully, to not perhaps a happy ending, but a redemptive ending. Well, so then come all of her <laughs> daughters, the yeah. many daughters that come after mm -hmm. her. And, and as I said when I introduced this book to our audience, I mean, you created a world, um, a love story in World War II. You created a boarding school in um, England in the, in the, third, yeah, in the, the 20s. 20s yeah. In the 20s. Late you, 20s. Late 20s. I'm like early 30s. You got the it. 20s. You created um, a world that's sort of contemporary mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley. And then a speculative world in 2045. Yeah. How did you decide, <laughs> of all of the daughters that came after, how did you come up with all of these really cool worlds? <laughs> Um, I, I, I go down a lot of historical rabbit holes. It's the same notion that many people viewing this, they have those moments where they, they go to Wikipedia to look up one specific thing, and then three hours later, they've been distracted and they've you know, learned everything they can about Danny DeVito or something like that. It was not what their intention was. And I had amassed some ideas, some things that I wanted to explore. One was a Summerhill School in England in the 20s and 30s. Is that a real place? It's still there to wow. this day. Yeah. And, it, and each of these narratives, like I could almost write a whole book about that. Each, well, definitely. Yeah, because they were so fast. Like the Summerhill School, um, the headmaster, A.S. Neal, created this bohemian school yes. in the 20s. He wrote a book about parenting and that book and, and education and it was, it had this uh, revival in the late 60s, became a bestseller, and that book became the blueprint for the alternative high schools that we have today. Wow. I mean, that's one story. Yeah, I mean, these worlds are incredible. So you start, there are seven main characters, mm -hmm. if you yeah, include there, there's, Dorothy. There's yeah, there's six main characters, and then her mom is there, too. Yes, so she's exactly. The okay, yeah. so, um, or or her, da her the daughters, who I'm thinking. Oh, true. You're right. Yes. There's, okay. there's actually eight. There's actually eight? eight. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I mean, it's there's all these there's different a lot going worlds. On. There's yeah. a lot going on, but you start, obviously, with the arc of Afong. How did you decide about the other women? How did you, oh. and, and talk about the process. So yeah. do you start, I know that you have a beginning mm -hmm. and an ending, which is so wild to me. <laughs> um, talk about the process of writing this book. Um, I, I wanted to write slightly into the future, not, not the year 5,000, but just a, a few decades hence, traffic's worse, mm -hmm. things like that. Climate um, change. Climate change, worse. yeah, there's, there's some serious things. And to get there, I needed lifetimes and lifespans, and I actually calendared it out and said, this character, if she was born on this day, um, gave birth on this day, died on this day, where would she be? Where would it fall with the next? And there's actually two male descendants that I just left out of the book um, by design, because historically, men have always had it easier 
in every generation. Um, the trauma of men versus the trauma of women, they're, they're not even in the same category. Um, we call it history because the etymology of that is his story. We, women are, are forgotten. Um, even in that narrative in the 20s where one of the characters is reflecting on how the suffrage movement in, yeah. in the UK um, was successful, women got the right to vote but they couldn't vote until they were 30 and if mm. they were married. I mean, that's not really a victory. Mm. And so I, I focused on the, the daughters, the descendants, because one, the trauma could be mirrored in a similar way, but also they just had steeper hills to climb in every generation. And with each generation, as we project into the future, we can give them a little bit more of an opportunity advantage, but also show that even in 2045, the main character of Dorothy is still struggling with things compared to her male counterparts. Mm -hmm. Okay, and which which character? And you've said this on the show, <laughs> but which one did you relate with the relate to the most? Yeah. And which one was the most challenging to oh, write? Oh wow, um, the one I related to the most was Greta. And her narrative is contemporary; it takes place in modern times. She's a she's a computer programmer uh, working in the tech industry. Um, she's just this charming, lovable, super geek. And um, I don't know about the charming or the lovable, but I certainly was- You are charming was, and lovable. Don't I, leave those two I up. certainly was a super geek. So I very much relate to Greta in, she's, she's just precocious in a strange way. Um, the one that was most challenging was Sly King. And that's the narrative mm -hmm. that's set in the late 1800s, San Francisco, the plague epidemic. Um, Cause her story was so heartbreaking. Yeah, I mean, part of it, I shouldn't say part of it, a lot of it, I mean, it could have even been more tragic than what yeah. I put on the page. Um, and in some ways it was, um, my editor, uh, someone recently asked like, you know, how much did, how much say did your editor have? And it's not how much, it's how important. And what my editor kept saying to me is, is Jamie, we, we need the reader to survive the journey. Mm. Cause I was making it a little, too tragic, and I don't want it to be so tragic that they're just like, oh, I can't go mm -hmm. on, it's breaking my heart. Mm -hmm. So it's that, just the right beat and tempo to bring the reader along and, you know, have a, tug their heartstrings, but not crush them yeah. at the same well, time. Well, it's the balance of light and really dark, is. the balance really of is. love and grief. So some tragedy, but also you, you say that you have yeah. a soft spot for love stories. Yeah, I have a, a deep abiding weakness for love stories. <laughs> um, I love love stories and it's weird when you're a dude and you love love stories. And I, I have dude friends and we do the ritualistic things guys mm -hmm. do, which is go to the sports bar and eat chicken wings. And, <laughs> and they're always like, what are you working on? Like the next born ultimatum. And I'm like, it's, it's a love story. Um, and I just had to shamelessly go there. It was something that I knew about myself as, as, a, as a young boy. I was like this hypersensitive little kid that would cry at sad movies. And, and later, when you're that boy in high school that is really sentimental and cries at sad movies, that's not like the most beneficial trait in high school. High school is about how far can you throw a football and things like mm -hmm. that. But all of those things that I perceived as my weaknesses as a kid, those things became my superpowers as as a writer, as an adult. You say you work in the compassion business. Yeah. And it is books, I mean, this, we can't underestimate the company that they give people, the hope, it, uh, the hope to help spread empathy and yeah. connection. I mean, right now, hopefully people are watching this and they're gonna call their book club right. after to talk about right. it. Um, how did you, how did you get into <laughs> that part of this work? Um, yeah, I call it the, the compassion creation business. I, I like thrillers and <laughs> movies and books with asteroid collisions and car crashes. It's just not what I, what I want to write about. I'm much more interested in stories of the, the human heart and conflict with itself. Um, I think most of us, if we, if we admit it, those are the stories that are, we can relate to. We can't literally relate to an alien invasion, but we literally can relate to um, the loss of a loved one. Mm -hmm. and books are a platform for creating empathy. And I, I do think if you, if you create art, whether it's a film or a series or a book or music or a play, and it does address 
topics that exercise your empathy muscles, when those things are injected into the body of a population, you can, in, in a small way, inoculate our society against the things that plague us, you mm -hmm. know, sexism and homophobia and racism, bigotry, things like that. When you, can, when you can take someone and put them in the shoes of someone else and create empathy and understanding and bridge those two worlds, then I think as, a, as an author, I'm using my superpowers for good. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos. The learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to today. we got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Tell me a little bit about you as a, I mean, we did this piece on the show, mm -hmm. but about your personal family history oh, and how yeah. it might have led you to this book. Yeah, I, you know, Afong came here alone at a very young age. My great grandfather came to this country in 1865 as a 13 year old um, from a poor part of China, came here to find his way in the world, came through San Francisco, ended up in Tonopah, Nevada, working in the mining industry. Um, and again, a stranger in a strange land where he had every disadvantage, and yet it's part of the, it's the American story of coming here hoping for a better life, not just for yourself, but for your children. You're, you're carving out a space for them, and I'm grateful for him. He, he created a better life for, you know, for my dad, mm -hmm. who worked really hard to create a better life for me, and that's, that's what every parent wants mm -hmm. is... Um, to create a, a better space for the, the next generation. Um, and I could relate to that because the struggles of Afong were the struggles of my grandfather. Um, he changed his name. He changed his name for, yeah, from, from Min Chong to William Ford, which is how I, I'm yeah, the, the Chinese kid Ford. with the last name Ford. <laughs> um, confusing everybody, but, um, but it makes for an interesting story and it highlights a bit of history, which is, which is good. But, but I, I Why did he change his name, do you think? Because he couldn't buy land? Is that yeah, right? I, I mean, no one knows for sure. Um, I describe it as someone coming to this country now from Pakistan and changing their name to Chuck Norris. Mm -hmm. Like, we're just going to be America. Mm -hmm. Get it on. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was, it, it, it aided his assimilation. Um, it, it helped his career opportunities and certainly helped him buy land. Nevada was a territory. He was probably buying land from someone that lived in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, put it in my great-grandmother's name. Her name is Loy Lee Ford um, because she was born here. So she was an American citizen by birth because she was afraid that somehow the land would be taken away from them. And because of that, she became the first Chinese woman to own land in Nevada. She's in Nevada history books. Wow. Um, and the things that are you know, our family struggled through of, of every generation. Um, I just, I respect the struggle 
And, and do you feel like you feel some of that struggle the way that maybe the daughters of Afang? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm part of all those characters, but I'm certainly the ones near the end of the book where life is a blank slate now. Mm -hmm. And you, you have new opportunities. You're not, you've es escaped, perhaps, uh, a cycles of, of poverty and, um, you know, just problematic childhoods and get to a point where you can see opportunity where before you saw hurdles. More with Jamie Ford, the author of The Many Daughters of Ah Fong Moi, after this. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? You found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? You found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? We yeah. have to end with this, though, <laughs> sure. because you're in a, a book club yourself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your book club. I'm in a guy's book club, which that's not supposed to exist like it's like a unicorn but it, but I've been in a guys book club for 10 plus years we rate all of the books on a scale of one to six beers so <laughs> that's, how, that's how we do it it's called the books and brews book club um, occasionally there have been some six six beer books um, is six the best the best yeah it's it's just been a I get book clubs now like I, I visit them as an author um, you lead one of the greatest ones on the planet and just to be in one myself, like, I, I understand yes. certain books just have so much juicy stuff that you just want to talk about with other people who've enjoyed the book. Wasn't that, I feel like, I mean, I'm just going to say, wasn't this book that you wrote the perfect book club <laughs> pick? But it was. Because you created the, these so many different worlds and you tell the story of so many different women. And my husband read this, so I guess we're in a marital book club. Yeah. He, he said, well, this is my favorite character. <laughs> Faye is my favorite character. And I, you know, had a different, Greta's my favorite. And everybody yeah. had a different um, favorite, and not that that is important, but I think it gives everybody a woman to fall in love with, it, to find hope in. It really does. Everyone has their own story, and then they bring their own emotional journey to the party, and they're going to connect with someone, um, someone different, and it, that's juicy stuff to talk about, as well as I do think it's a book that when you're done reading it, you're going to reflect on your own life, mm. your parents, your grandparents, your children, and you're going to have perhaps more questions than are answered in the book. Mm -hmm. And that's a great way to leave readers. Well, it will lead to so many important yeah. conversations. Jamie, this book changed my life. I know oh, it changed so many others too. Mine. <laughs> it well, changed all of ours. Um, thank you so much for being here. And I truly loved The Many Daughters of Afang Moy. I can't wait to see what comes next, to see it on the screen. And to all of our audience, if you enjoy all things book related, follow us on Instagram at Read with Jenna. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jamie. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
jumping straight in, gang's back together. What's it like being back together for the festival? I hate these people. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's great. Sarah, Zach, and I got here two days ago, and we uh, partied a little bit. And then these guys came in. Bill got in in the morning yesterday, and we partied a little bit. And then last night, we, we everybody else got in, and we partied a little bit more. So uh, <laughs> it's just like old times. <laughs> Pulled an all-nighter, and now And then went right we to work. It's so nostalgic last night to be sitting around with the gang telling old stories and, and talking about all the people we love and stuff. It's really emotional. I'm not an emotional guy, usually. And the first thing Donald said to me this morning was, he said, you almost cried last night. <laughs> Which is so grade school, by the way. I'm still mad about it. <laughs> but, uh, but I did. I did. It made what, me really happy. What was it that almost got you? For me, it was seeing everybody again. I love all these people. Uh, I don't just want to work with them. I like being around them. And then walking down the streets of Austin uh, as a group for dinner, and having people that were just going out to have a night do double takes and go, you from Scrubs? <laughs> we changed the streets uh, on the way home for dinner because there were so many drunk people that it was becoming hard to get home. <laughs> well, I think it would be overwhelming to be drunk on the streets of Austin. And, and the entire see. cast of Scrubs walking yeah. by. <laughs> and not just one of you. I mean, it's the entire cast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we were walking in one group. <laughs> we've all, I mean, we've hung out over the years, but this is the first time in years, obviously, since being of the pandemic that we've all done this and Bill took us for this amazing dinner last night and we were like thanks for dinner Bill and thanks for a career right by the way because yeah. this job changed all, all of our, our lives, lives. And, and not just your lives I mean one of the things that we hear time and time again from medical professionals is this was the show yeah. that made him want to get into medicine of all of the medical shows this is what universally doctors and nurses say was the most accurate. I think that's such a testament to Bill because he always said, we're going to be very silly sometimes, but I always want the medicine to be completely accurate so it balances it out. Bill, you're not a doctor. Not yet. <laughs> I'm not a doctor, but I guarantee you everybody in the panel agrees that one thing from this TV show more than any gig I've ever had is you and your entire extended family use it whenever you're in a medical situation. At a <laughs> whenever you're in a hospital, we're getting a surgery just oh, yeah. to be like, like I know. you guys are the scrubs, <laughs> make sure I don't die. <laughs> do, do, do you guys get a lot of calls from friends saying, hey, I know you're not a real doctor, but uh, I've got this condition. No, but we all call, uh, this is inspired by uh, Bill's college buddy, a doctor, cardiologist now named John Doris. And I don't know about you guys, but we, we almost all call him when, as a second we have a medical problem. Because I text him, I'm like, does this look bad? You know. You know. Definitely, definitely <laughs> mistake to give up me his number. <laughs> I'm kind of a hypochondriac a little bit. Kind of. He's the real JD, so we call him real. So we're always like, real, we have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and he was your, your college roommate? My college roommate. He ended up having Dr. Kelsey's job. He was uh, he's in the news for giving the first vaccine in LA. He ran the vaccine program for all kinds. He's a huge cardiologist and surgeon out there. He doesn't go by JD anymore because he said it's too exhausting to keep explaining to med students. <laughs> so he goes by John now. He's and like, so I can't. When I'm trying to tell somebody to not kill someone, it's too hard for me when they go, was it all based on you? <laughs> Who's Elliot? <laughs> so, so when you went to school together yeah. and you guys were roommates, you probably saw him partying. I mean, oh, someone... dude, he was a disaster. <laughs> really? Yeah, this show exists on some level because they said my nightmare knowing who he was in his early 20s would be to wake up in an emergency room and see that idiot over me. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be fine, man. And I'd be like, I don't feel good about this at all. <laughs> and that's what we saw on the show. Yeah, he's a great guy, though. Great. And this is good Scrubs trivia. You guys see if you guys can get it. Elliot is based on JD's wife. Do you know JD's wife's name? Because I'm bad at naming characters. I named another character after her on Dolly our show. Dolly Clock, Molly. Molly Clark. Uh, Heather Graham plays Heather Molly Graham, Clock, right. who's Dolly Clock. Dolly is JD's wife, who is actually Elliot. Is it hard to keep track of all the people you have had on the show? Yeah, it's a testament to aging. It's really hard. And I just started watching the episodes now. My, my child is watching the show. Um, so uh, they're always asking me questions. When you did this, did, you, did that happen? I was like, uh. Yeah. <laughs> did all your kids watch? No. My, my, my youngest, Henry, he's 15. He finally, because he resisted, and then he finally watched it during the, uh, you know, when we were all kind of locked up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so <laughs> underwhelming, by the way. He, I know he enjoyed it, but he's a cool 15-year-old. And I walked in when he was finishing the eighth season, and I go, what'd you think? He goes, hey, pretty good. Um, you want to go get a pizza or something? <laughs> One of our uh, other uh, writers, Matt Tarsus, was excited that his kids finally wanted to watch. And, That's you know, the work. show is pretty darn risque um, still. Um, and he walked in and he was watching some intense 
I don't know, sex scene or something good. between characters. And, mm -hmm. and Matt was like, all right, enjoy. I'll be, uh, I'm going to go in the <laughs> other room. <laughs> it's always well, impressive how people are, you know, it's literally a show about death. And, but all those sex scenes make people uncomfortable. When we get to that place where we're talking about they're not as worried and that's a testament also to build to like surround what it really is about with humor all those things that are inevitable yes. in life and try to have yeah. some fun and some sex <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, can't, I can't imagine what that was like when you first started because it was a comedy and yet death is such a big role how did you get that on TV death and comedy I, uh, I think well look it's a testament to the actors and actresses here that worked because it's very hard to do really silly stuff and then have things with emotional stakes and have it switch on a dime. But I think we all operated under the belief that the show was going to go away because that's how TV worked. Neil Flynn and I, we were talking last night, even though it's now lore, we had a conversation that I always thought for a second he was going to be a figment of Zach's imagination. You people, you think of me as nothing but the janitor. So we never talked to any other characters at first, really. You know, just because I thought the show was going to be on and off, you know, so quick. So for us, just getting to do it for so long is such a, a gift. And for me personally, getting to hear all, all these folks say such nice things about the experience, you know, especially how I think we've all tried to kind of recapture it since then it was kind that's, of really special. That's the crazy thing is that you go to other sets and you're like, we're like family, guys. We're like, you try to force it. We're like family. <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, it doesn't feel like that. Yeah. It doesn't feel like this ever. Right. It never feels like this. It gets close, but never like this. No eagles on no, other sides. No, listen, man. I mean, <laughs> I found my life partner while making this show, man. It's like. Like, like, by the way, this should be on the yeah, Today exactly, Show. Exactly. Your he wife's going to watch wife. this. Oh, my wife is watching? <laughs> <laughs> I found my life partner, Casey Cobb, <laughs> while making Scrubs. <laughs> and we have two beautiful children together. I didn't, I didn't hear that. <laughs> what's, uh, what's the thing that you guys must get people asking you to eagle all the time? Eagle! Judy, Sarah, Johnny C, do you get people? To girl's come? name. People want me to call them a girl's name. <laughs> And there's a couple of go-tos, and then I keep walking. Yeah, okay. Well, All right, I, Susan. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you, Susan. What are you doing? <laughs> he cross-gendered me. Our Donald and I are doing this rewatch podcast uh, where we... Uh, it's called Fake Doctors, Real Friends for all of you. Yeah, thank you, you for the plug. It's so very, a very surreal experience because we don't remember a lot of it. But it is our exact sense of humor, obviously, because we find the show very funny. <laughs> oh, Turk, that's a stupid sitcom. <gasps> I mean, that's a sitcom. And we were, so we were cracking up at stuff you don't remember, but it's you. And it's, it's just such a bizarre uh, experience. Yeah, it's like, I was there, but I just don't remember. And so we're watching it anew and enjoying it and laughing through six seasons thus far. And, and then you're like, I have no memory of doing that, but that was very, very funny. Yeah, I didn't realize I was naked as much as I was. <laughs> you were naked a lot. You looked yeah. great. Yeah. We had a rule on that show. This is why the character of the Todd kind of exists <laughs> you know we really wanted it to be about comedy but sex and love and death all intermixed and we said oh we're going to be risque sexually and judy and sarah were both scantily clad a number of times but there's a very strong female presence in the writer's room they said it has to be equal opportunity as far and so the only way we could make up the gap was, was occasionally putting rob Maschio in a thong <laughs> Oh, that's right, the banana the hammock. The banana hammock, yeah. yeah. So the, the girls would all be like, yeah, Sarah or Judy, one of them had to wear a nightie and be kissing on some guy, so we're going to uh, definitely put Rob in a thong. <laughs> and we saw your nip. we almost saw your nipples. I they were always naked a lot. And I remember once I had to dance naked in front of Tara Reid. Yeah. And um, I'm going to today showify this. I, the, the minimal covering that was covering my area came off during the dance. Uh, uh, and so Tara Reid saw everything I have. <laughs> These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it!
the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. I got to ask about the dream sequences. They were extravagant. I mean, what was the most expensive dream sequence you ever came up with? The most expensive joke. And here comes a big one. Was I wanted Zach to be riding a scooter, and I wanted him to go in a puddle <laughs> and go underwater completely, and then come up. Where was I? And Randall, the line producer we all love dearly, who also played Leonard, the security guard. I still work with him. He's, he's, uh, he's uh, by the way, Randall and I are Turk and JD. We just kind of flipped a little bit. He came into the writer's room and he goes, this joke's going to cost $75,000. <laughs> he's like, you sure you want to do it? And at that point, I was, you know, I was not as responsible as I think I would be now. And I'm like, yeah, it's going to be really funny. He's like, it's a $75,000 joke. You sure? He's like, we're going to have to have a stuntman drive in with the weights attached to his pockets and so then, he and, stays underwater. And destroy a scooter. And then because the holes were, um, had needed to be deep enough, they had the, the city made them, what do you call it when you put wood to secure? Yeah, yeah they, it was like we were digging a pool in the parking lot. They had to come in and like make it like safe. <laughs> Because it could all, the, the asphalt could have collapsed on us both. And, and you saw a manatee down there, right? Yes, his <laughs> name was Julian. Julian. Yes. <laughs> Did he say anything? That's Julian. He didn't, he didn't, and uh, we didn't exchange pleasantries. <laughs> and then Neil says, uh, that's Julian. <laughs> that was all in To tip our hat to Neil Flynn, that was not in the script. He was yeah. just being Neil Flynn. I think I saw a manatee. Was his name Julian? We didn't exchange pleasantries. That's Julian. How much ad-libbing did you guys do? I would say Neil did most of the ad living. We got, you know, we did it the way Bill wanted us to do it, and then he would like he would say play around a little bit, but Neil would just go, like it would it wouldn't be lines for him. It would just be a Neil says something funny, and then he would go I off and it, really crush. One, two. Oh. Yeah. No. Give me five hundred dollars. Everybody here. When the show's working, you can tell that the ownership of characters shifts from the uh, writers to the actors and actresses, and everyone here would do stuff that was not on the page that we would use and take credit for. They're also talented. The one that was it, did it a little less because it was Johnny C, because I was not, uh, you know, always super prepared as a writer, and I would hand John these giant page-long monologues, and, and I'd be like, right. "You got to do this." word for word in about 45 minutes. So if there's anything I can help you with, you go ahead and let me know. <laughs> is, that, is that where the Dr. Cox anger came from? Interns, flee now. Now there is just no way you could have known that off the top of that straw-covered scarecrow head of yours. But no, the, the, two things, the two things that happened was I was so, I was so competitive with Billy that I decided if I was going to memorize this, I was not going to give you a cut point you're gonna damn sure stay on me the whole time. And so I would take a huge breath and then talk in kind of a Martin Scorsese syncopation and I never gave him a cut point. Foolish me, Billy cut away whenever he wanted. <laughs> and I was so panicked with being handed on Monday morning a rewrite, which was really much better than when I spent the whole weekend memorizing. I had my room soundproofed. Um, because Zach and Donald were responsible for so much mayhem going on in the hallway <laughs> that I couldn't concentrate. And then for the first year, dogs were allowed in the hospital yeah. until one bit another one. And then Do you finally... remember what you said about the dog? Just so you know, we all lived in a deserted hospital, and we let everybody bring their dogs, and their kids were around, people in his family atmosphere. And John came to me once, and he was not joking, and he had dogs, and he said, uh, I will sacrifice one of my dogs as an offering. <laughs> I couldn't concentrate. We, we could simply make it so there's no dogs here in the building. And of course, as karma dictates, because I couldn't stand them the most, because I was in such a panic trying to get the words in my skull, they all peed and pooped right outside my door. 
all you would all, 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 all you would all you would ever hear was Johnny go get out, and you see some poor dog walk wandering out of this room. I couldn't memorize with all this stuff going on. That's why when I listen to Zachy and Donald's podcast, uh, Fake Doctors, Real Friends, um, which is genius, uh, I, it's all news to me because I was in my soundproof dressing room trying to remember <laughs> Billy's words. So we, we really did shoot in an abandoned hospital. We didn't have trailers. Each of our trailers were abandoned hospital rooms, patient rooms. And one of the things that made this family so um, special was we weren't on some giant back lot. We weren't on sets. I mean, some, you know, obviously some of the sets, like the apartment, et cetera, the bar, they were built into the hospital. But we had our own studio. We were, everything was in this abandoned hospital. And, and so it really did bond us with the crew, obviously as a cast. The writers were all there. The editorial was all there. And it was just a, such a unique experience. I don't know what could ever happen again because it, 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 it was like we were on our, a ship together. That writers was a big piece of that. Like, in every show since then, like, that was my first big job. And I kind of thought, oh, that's how it works. And then on every other job, you don't often meet the, all the writers because you're not on the same campus all together. Mm -hmm. And we would all eat lunch together at the lunch tent, and the writers would all come too, and we'd hang out with them, or we'd go down to the writers' room and hang out. And that's, yeah, it's not an experience that yeah. I've ever seen. And yeah, I, and you try to recreate it, but every set I go to, you know, it's great to be around actors and everything like that, but it's really about the crew, you know what I mean? And so you really try to, what we had on our set was the crew was just, like Zach said, was just a part, was a part of the family, just like the actors were. We did everything with them after work. We would go to bars, we would go, like, we had a lot of nights where we all were together. And I try to do that when I go to other sets. And people aren't really up for that, you <laughs> right. know what I mean? Especially now with all, you know, with the pandemic mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But I don't think I'll ever experience what we had on this show again, we as Paul did. So end young. line, no matter what anybody else says. <laughs> end line of the piece, no matter what anybody else I was says. I, I was trying to get it. Everybody, <laughs> everybody here is going for it, by the way. I was trying to get it. I was well, trying well, to get I it. I want to do it. Wait, 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 just, wait. Your turn, your turn, your no, turn. Wanna, but I'm not going to do anything new. I'm just going to see who they pick. Watch this. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think any of us are ever going to have that type of experience <laughs> ever again. I've heard some of you say that this was the best time of your life. Yeah. So does yeah. that still stand? I had stand? nothing to compare it to. So when, when we were there, I thought, this, this is amazing. This is how it works. This is how it works on shows. So when you go to another show and, you know, it's more of a, a, an individual effort to know the entire crew's name, for, try to uh, get friendly with the writers and stuff, you know, but it is something because of this experience and how it was set up that we bring or that I bring to, to another job, mm -hmm. you know, and it's again, it's, it's impossible to repeat. But it's it's a wealth of experience and a journey that you can't compare to anything else, but that you can try. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Well, meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts.
These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Your chemistry is legendary. How did you get things done? I mean, how did you get through <laughs> takes? We laughed so much. We loved the worst. Who was the worst? Who was the worst at keeping a straight face? Watch this, watch this. We discovered that there was a noise that there was a specific <laughs> noise we could make, that noise, and Sarah would always start laughing. Oh, and, and so we would mess with her when it was like midnight and the crew was like, we need to go home. We all have families. But we would do it so quietly that the crew wouldn't notice that we were doing it. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was largely my and own, snort. I and snort. I was largely I my own worst think, enemy. And when they but, do that, I was like, why is she <laughs> I would, I would largely beat myself up because I never liked the camera to cut. And I would just, shy of flailing, uh, putting a right right into my eye if I made a mistake with some of Billy's words. I would have a temper tantrum aimed at me and then continue. You'd occasionally hit a wall yeah. or a, yep. yeah, a paper <laughs> towel dispenser. <laughs> that's the thing. I, think, I feel like Johnny paper. knew where the, you know, there's going to be plywood here, and then this is just going to be an empty wall. Boom! You don't want to hit the stud. Right, you don't want to hit the stud. Yeah, Johnny knew where to right. not hit the stud. Where not to hit. I, I was just thinking last night how it was the best job in the world because you knew you were going to belly laugh several times a day. And that was just obviously the scripts, but also just we loved each other so much and we cracked each other up. And there was so much downtime that we just laugh all day long. And uh, I haven't had any experience like that ever. I, uh, like, I don't even eat lunch <laughs> at the, at the, with the crew and everything anymore. I just go right to my trailer. <laughs> well, I think COVID, you know, obviously made, it yeah, yeah. changed all that. All of us. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're, on, you're on other sets and you're FaceTiming them. Oh, I FaceTime him all the time. <laughs> Yeah. I once FaceTimed, we had something that we had to do and I FaceTimed him and he was pissed because I couldn't make it. I was stuck at work. He's like, put the, put the AD on the phone. I was like, get out of here. Don't put the AD on the phone. I was like, I want to talk to the first assistant. <laughs> I was like, no. Well, <laughs> and speaking of phones, there was, you had a phone number that you put on the show and did that Cal phone? Cal Turk. Yeah, Cal Turk. That was insane. What I can't it? believe they let us do that. You know, no one in America can have that number again because I they didn't realize what was going to happen. <laughs> called up, and I'm like, is there an open phone number? They're like, what are you going to do? I'm like, because you can't say a real phone number on TV. We've all lived the world of, you know, them saying 555, right. so, you know, and uh, well, like, I want to get a real one. I'm going to put, this is our promotion idea. I'm going to put Turk's phone number on television. We had a map of everywhere in the world that people would call from. And my weirdest experience, because I got so excited that people from everywhere were watching the show, is I took the, ho the phone home one night, and these guys <laughs> all know, I'm gonna curse here so we can bleep it out, but these guys all know my wife and who she is as a human being. And I was getting home from work around midnight, I walked up into the bedroom, and I was talking, I answered it, and it was a super fan. And uh, she was like, uh, uh, oh my God, and tell me about this, and tell me about that. And I'm like, well, the cool thing about the show, and Krista goes, hang that Phone up. <laughs> wait, wait. There's, a, there's a pause, and then this person on the line goes, Oh my God, is that Jordan? Yeah. <laughs> 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 So, so this was a phone that you, you everyone would answer it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was in, it was in the production yeah. office, and if you, sometimes you turn it off because it rang literally nonstop, nonstop. And sometimes it was just, you know, the, everyone's trying to work, so they would turn it off. The second you turned it on, it would just oh, ring yeah. nonstop. And so it would just get passed around. Like, you'd, you'd, you'd randomly pick it up and go, hi, and someone would be calling from, like, Australia. And then and, and you'd hand it off to Donald, or you'd hand it off to anyone walking by. And, but it, if, if it was on, it was ringing. <laughs> It, speaking of phones, I mean, have you guys received Scrubs gifts? Because they are, they're everywhere. I mean, I use your gifts right all the on. time. I haven't received any, but I've seen one that, one, my favorite one is when we're rubbing our faces against each other. <laughs> like, yeah. all the time. That's my favorite I one. I get digging, Elliot digging her own grave. Digging that one gets sent to me. Yeah, so I, get, I get Carla. <laughs> Carla looking, looking sassy. I get, uh, but there's one that's, that has a subtitle that screams internally. <laughs> When I'm screaming, when I'm, I've seen yours because your biggest one out there is man not caring. Oh, right. Yeah, it's everywhere. Who <laughs> made Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time? When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? 
Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Welcome back to you today. We got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody good, and that's it. Yeah. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. It seems as though a younger generation is now discovering Scrubs and going through it all over again. That's yeah, great. You have young people, you don't understand, your show got me through nursing school. And then you realize, oh my God, that was 20 years ago. It's happened so fast, and it's also like what you were saying, watching a show that's hilarious, you're kind of outside of yourself. So it's kind of, I, I'm a fan. I'm a fan, so I, 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 an episode will come up and I'm like, mm. it's kind of like scrolling through your phone, you just watch it, and through TikTok, this thing that I don't have and I've never, <laughs> my kid, my kid has become hip to the show, and, and they love it, it's amazing. I still feel like 2001 was two weeks ago, to be mm -hmm. honest totally. with you, it really does feel that way. Hey, look, um, it's a good segue to, everybody here was talking last night uh, about how grateful we are, um, so it's just not patting ourselves on the back, you know, it's how grateful we are that people still watch, still care, still are invested. It's such a gift. And oh, Scrubs trivia for when these guys get to their, uh, my podcast. My podcast is doing very well, it by the way. It's called, it it's called Fake Doctors for Friends. Thanks, guys. I put it together. I, I hired Donald and Zach oh needed God. some work. <laughs> like uh, but here's some trivia is in the finale of the show, the real finale, which is season eight, Zach walks down the hall and the speech he gives, we really spent a weekend trying to write a speech that is both about being a doctor and about being an actor, actress, or TV writer. And his speech is really about what it means to do what we all do, because he says, if you can even just make someone feel better for a second, you know, that's all you can really ask for. Mm -hmm. And so for us, all of the people that take the time to come to us individually or online and tell us that this meant something to them, it, this is a great opportunity to say thanks because I know we're all really grateful. One of the coolest parts was over the pandemic, all of the doctors and nurses that we heard from, um, yes. that was super special. And that was also great to, to do, uh, doing the podcast. It was nice to have people call in and actually not just that but also it was like a love it's a love letter to all of the uh people who were on the front line for COVID and mm -hmm. stuff like that that was nice to give back to them and tell them how much we appreciated them while we were going through which is not over apparently this mm -hmm. pandemic for the last year, i have an two idea years for an ending the poison dance no that's not happening <laughs> <laughs> it would make me so happy yeah i, I know like, it would make everybody so happy so that happen. So as i recall you showed up to work, you were late, and you didn't know what we were shooting that day. Right, no. And he walks in the room, and they go, you haven't read it? And he goes, no. And I go, oh, you're, you're dancing to Poison. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and the whole room is packed with cast, crew, writers, writers everybody. Like, I was like, is this an event? <laughs> <laughs> and Who are we going to watch? What, what's going on? And they're like, you're dancing. And I was like, oh. And they played the song. And I, I mean, come on, man. I grew up on New Edition, and I grew up on Belle Bib DeVoe, so that was really <laughs> easy. And then Fortnite took it. I am forever a legend, and I'm very honored. Listen, I am a forever a legend to my children who play that game because they're like, Dad, I'm doing your dance! And so, you suddenly become relevant to your kids. Yeah. Right? At one point, I did complain about it, and I had every 12-year-old boy Twittering or TikToking how much of a loser I am. And then my son, my son looked at me and he said, Dad, this makes you an even bigger legend. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll accept that. We were at a pool uh, yesterday and they started cranking TLC's I Don't Want No Scrubs. And Donald's like, don't start dancing. 
Don't do not start dancing. Don't embarrass us at this pool by start dancing to TLC scrubs. Well, I don't. I won't tell the story. But well, you know what? there have been a couple times when we've yep. been overserved and we couldn't help ourselves. <laughs> yeah. But dance too. I don't want no scrubs. That's right. In the middle of a club. I don't want no scrubs. <laughs> He's almost going to do it. That almost happened. Almost happened. Thank you, guys. Thank you you very much. Thank you for having us. Well, hello to you all. It's great to be back for another brand new Popstar Plus coming up on today's show. The cast of a very hot show from creator Mindy Kaling, it's called Never Have I Ever, is back for season three. We'll tell you what we know about that. Then, if you're missing Sterling K. Brown on This Is Us, you're in luck because he's out with a new film and he stopped by Studio 1A to tell us all about it. And then later, a throwback with Robert De Niro on how he tackled one of his greatest roles in Raging Bull. But first, here are today's Popstar headlines. With The Wizard of Oz, get ready to head back down the what? Yellow Brick Road. Blackish creator Kenya Barris is working on a reimagined version huh. of the classic film. Barris is set to write and direct the upcoming project for Warner Brothers. Besides that, the movie is going to be based on L. Frank Baum's iconic book, all other details being quite uh, tightly kept under wraps. And it's Dorothy who's going to have to get in line. The movie comes in addition to another remake of Wizard of Oz that was announced recently last year by New Line Cinema. So okay. a lot of interest wow. in okay. that. Wow. Mm-hmm. Next up, Adele, the British singer, covers the latest edition of Elle magazine. Inside that magazine, Adele speaking up about the events that she calls, quote, the worst moment in her career. You might recall back in January, she announced that she was going to be postponing that Vegas residency due to COVID-related production delays. She did that just one day before she was set to take the stage. Now the Grammy winner is opening up about why she made that tough decision, telling Elle the stage setup just wasn't right. It was very disconnected from me and my band, and it lacked intimacy. Adele goes on to say, I don't think people would have, a lot of people, many people would have done what I did. I'm very proud of myself for standing by my artistic needs. And on a lighter note, she's also addressing those buzzy engagement rumors that have been swirling around the internet recently, saying that she's not engaged to boyfriend Rich Paul, but she could see herself getting married again. That September issue of Elle hits newsstands on August 30th. Of course, you can check out more information at today.com. And next up, we teased it earlier, our friend Joanna Gaines. We have a special pop star exclusive announcement this morning mm-hmm. that she's got a new book on the way. It's her first solo memoir. It's called The Stories We Tell. Mm-hmm. The best-selling author promises in the new project. Uh, it's going to be an authentic and deeply vulnerable journey into her story, and she hopes readers join her by thinking about chapters in their own lives with this book. So mark your calendars. The Stories We Tell will hit shelves on November 8th, but if you can't wait that long, it is available to pre-order starting today. So congratulations to Joanna. And finally, another pop star exclusive sneak peek. This one for Simone Biles, her latest project. We've got the Olympic gold medalist heading to Snapchat for a new series called Daring Simone Biles. The Snap original is going to feature her as she tries new adventures, things like beekeeping and DJing and hosting a talk show with fellow Olympian Tara Lipinski. Here's a first look at the trailer. I'm Simone Biles. Go. I spent my whole life challenging myself and shattering limits. Okay, nice. But now, we know you can smell that. I'm gonna push myself Careful. way out of my comfort zone. Take it. Oh my God. I'm getting off the mat and taking on new challenges. You should host your own talk show. I don't know if I can do it. Let's see what you got. Things I've always wanted to do. Ew, ew, ew. Been scared to do. And never got the opportunity to do. What year is this? <laughs> the most amazing journeys in life start when you dare to experience something new. You ready? The show sort of begs okay. the question, like, what can't Simone Biles yeah, do? Exactly. She's probably just oddly amazing at all <laughs> yeah. of these bizarre yeah. things. Yeah. Uh, you can catch the 10-part series starting this Saturday. New episodes will air every other day through September 7th. Again, that is on Snapchat. Guys. All right. And, of course, there's more to know. This is Popstar Plus, after all. Lizzo dropped a new music video yesterday. It's for her single, To Be Loved, Am I Ready, off her latest studio album special. In the video, the Grammy winner is a runaway bride on a mission. Take a look. Oh, 
of course, some Lizzo fans might recognize that bridal veil from the 2017 music video for Truth Hurts, which she also brought right here to today, the first time that she performed on our plaza. So the veil getting some good use in the world of Lizzo. Well, that was a great concert, by the way. We need to get Lizzo back. And then finally, Kate McKinnon, during the comedian's legendary run on SNL, not only did she always have audiences cracking up, but often Kate and the cast found themselves in stitches on screen. Maybe most famously when she starred as one of our favorites, that's alien abductee, Colleen Rafferty. Interesting, and how would you describe their demeanor? Shoppers storming a Walmart on Black Friday. <laughs> Dropping and scrambling. I wonder if this was some sort of anatomical study? No, I don't think any of these guys are working on their master's thesis. In a new interview for Vulture's Good One podcast, McKinnon is opening up about how it felt in those rare moments when she simply couldn't keep it together on screen. I felt ashamed because we're not supposed to, and there's something unprofessional about it. And yet, sometimes... It was just too fun. There was a hint, I guess, of wanting the audience to know, like, oh, man, I love this. I really love what I'm saying right now, <laughs> you know? And I wanted them to know that yeah. I, as a person, was so tickled by what was going down. So sometimes I would allow myself to just yeah, yeah. go there. Well, who can blame her? And those are some of the funniest moments when they crack themselves up. Kate very much can be missed when the return of SNL hits the fall. Season 48 of SNL. Incredible. All right, coming up on Popstar Plus, guys, the cast of Never Have I Ever given us a sneak peek into the hit show's new season. Stay with us. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. Never Have I Ever is the hit coming-of-age dramedy created by none other than Mindy Kaling. And head of the show's third season, our very own Adana Farrison, got a chance to catch up with the cast to talk about their characters and how they navigate high school and relationships. My Trey, if you could um, name a Never Have I Ever chapter for this current stage in your life, oh, personally, right now, Oh, been a star. Oh my god. Hey. <laughs> I'll, I will take Darren's. Yeah, I'll take Darren's answer. I guess hey. never have I ever, you know, been a star of a TV show. Been a freaking star. Okay. Come we, on. Have edited, we have edited the sentence. Right. Freaking. <laughs> but we end season two with Davy and Paxton together. But I mean, let's be real. We all know that Ben is going to pine after Davy too. <laughs> Why do you think audiences love seeing this love triangle? I think it's just honestly, it's such opposite ends of a spectrum in terms of like her interests that you have on one end, someone who is exactly like her in so many ways and challenges her in so many ways and drives her absolutely mad. And then the other completely like seemingly unattainable dreamboat that she thinks she'll never be with. So they both seem somewhat unlikely to actually work out. 
And I think that conflict in general just keeps it interesting and mm -hmm. keeps you on your toes at all times. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mindy says it best, and I totally agree with her, that in TV especially, secure relationships are boring as hell. Like, if they're just secure <laughs> and happy all the time, it's no fun. So I know Mindy's a big fan of keeping things messy and moving all throughout like romantic lives with TV characters. So I think that's what really keeps the audience into it because there's just so many moving parts always. It's never always, you know, peachy keen. Hey Paxton, just thought you should know that we're dating the same person. I don't think so, man. I can explain. But the explanation might sound a lot like what Ben said. All of your characters have a lot of depth to them. Lee, we got to see Fabiola's journey with her sexuality blossom. Megan, last season we saw Anissa battle an eating disorder. Ramona, we saw Eleanor's complicated relationship with her mother. These are all things that we can all relate to as women, especially as women who are coming of age. What do you hope young viewers take away from your characters? I'm just so grateful that there's a show like this out right now. Like I was just having this conversation with my mom the other day and I was like, man, this would have been so beneficial for me if I had a show like this growing up, um, just to turn to someone that one looks like me, but then two is dealing with similar problems and, and being okay with the messiness, which is why I think Davy is so like loved is because she isn't this perfect girl. She's, you know, all over the place and that's okay. Noor, I understand why you're so angry. I mean, Davy was way out of line. So out of line. Like, the line was here and I was friggin' way over there. I agree. I think the characters handle very serious obstacles in their lives, but they do it with a sense of humor and relatability. And I love that young audiences get to enjoy that. First of all, it's an honor to play these characters because um, you know, it's so rare to have an opportunity to see characters like this and to play characters like this, especially South Asian and specifically talking about women of color who work in STEM or South Asian women who work in STEM. I know personally I've gotten messages and comments from other young women who are doing similar things, just saying I feel so represented and I feel so seen or this has given me inspiration to follow this career path. So. I think that's all we can really hope for is that it helps people to feel seen and inspires people to know that they can do something similar. How would you say you are most similar to your characters? I feel like I'm similar to Fabiola in the sense that she really cares about her friends. She's there for her friends and that she's gay. <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, but I also relate to like other characters too, like Davy, how she's like, you know, she's not a perfect person like in high school, which nobody is. In high school, I was a mess. I also relate to Eleanor because like the theater, I was a theater kid. So yeah, I feel like I could relate to everybody, which I think is a good thing. Like audience members can relate to like each character in, in different ways. And you know, I mean, I think it's really amazing too because there's so much representation behind the scenes also, of course, working with Mindy. What, what has it been like working with Mindy? First, when I went into it, I thought it'd be one thing, and now we're, we've come out of it, and it's been a transformational journey, and you're so right. Like, in front of the camera, there is so much representation, but it is reflected on both sides. The set feels so empowering. There's no hierarchy. There's a, such a sense of collaboration that Mindy and Lang have, have created. What are you looking forward to people seeing most in season three? I felt like in previous seasons, we've gotten to know the characters more. And I feel like this season is the first time where we really see the characters interact on a very deep relationship type of level. So I'm excited to see how all the characters respond to that. I think that I'm just so excited for everyone to watch these characters grow. I think that there's so much in this season. It's like so hilarious and heartwarming and witty and brilliant as it always is. But you're just gonna see all these characters that you love so much go through these crazy ups and downs. And I know that fans are gonna go wild over it. And I just can't wait for them to experience it with us. That's such a fun one. Season three of Never Have I Ever is now streaming on Netflix. Coming up, one of our favorites, Sterling K. Brown. Not gonna wanna miss that. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello. Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> for breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello. Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with us here on Pop Star Plus. Now, you know him from his role as Randall on the beloved show, This Is Us. But now, Sterling K. Brown is starring in a satirical comedy, and he stopped by Studio 1A to tell us all about it. We are back with one of our faves, Sterling K. Brown. He's starring in a new movie. It's called Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. <laughs> it's a mockumentary. It's about a pastor and his wife trying to reopen their church doors after a major scandal. Check it out. This is going to chronicle the ultimate comeback. This Easter is our revival, our renaissance. We winners, baby. You married a winner. And that's all I intend to do. Hey, I'm rocky up in this fight. <clears throat> you know? You're rocky up in this oh, fight? Yeah. Okay, first of all, we want to say thank you. We were tired of you making us cry. Thank you. It is high time we got a good Let's laugh. get some yucks. Come on. Hey, were you not? tired of making everyone cry? I, you know when, when people come up to me and be like, oh, my God. Oh, yes, I am so sad. Every time I see your show, I'm like, I know you do. Hopefully I can balance it yes, out. Now. Yes, yes. So picking a project after This Is Us and that run, yeah. I mean, it must be a lot of pressure. Like, this is, I'm like in my moment here. Yeah. So what do I do now? Something different. Yeah, yeah, something different. I think that's the first thing that you look for. Yeah. Like, Randall is such a beloved yeah. character. Yeah. I love him, but I want people to know me as, like, a well-rounded yeah. actor yeah. who can do a few different things. So doing a little comedy, stepping out with Regina <laughs> Hall, yeah. doing something completely different. That, that was the goal. And you said she was your acting crush. Like, oh, yeah. you were dying to work with her. How was it? For the long, It was everything I could have hoped for <laughs> and more. Yeah. Oh. Because her talent is only equaled by her humanity. So oh. beautiful human being, a beautiful performer. I love just your whole vibe in this. First of all, I love watching you dance. I Fair like do, you doing your thing. How much fun did you have making this? I had a blast. <laughs> you did? I grew up in the church yeah. and always had such reverence for pastors and sort of like, man, they're performers. Yeah. They're up on stage talking to their congregation. There's a call and response similar to being in theater. And so to get a chance to step in on that side, was kind of like full circle <laughs> moment for me. Did you, your, your parents used to say, you could be a preacher? Yeah. My mom would say that, but then I had also friends' parents who were pastors themselves. My yeah. best friend, Philip, his mom and dad had their own church. And he'd be like, ooh, Kelby going to be a preacher. <laughs> I said, Kelby ain't going to be a preacher. I might do something with it, but I ain't doing that. Now, can I ask you about your, your growing your hair out? I'm growing my hair out. Okay, is there, a, is there a reason or just because you feel, do you like looking at I it? I do like it! <laughs> You know what it is? I looked around at myself and like, I'm 46 years old. And I was like, not everybody can still do it. Yes. Like oh some, God. the hairline starts to retreat. No, not It yours. moves back a little bit. I said, I still got it all. So I'm going to play with it a does, little bit. Does your wife, what does she think of it? 
She likes the hair. Now, what she's confused about, concerned about, is anytime I try to do something <laughs> off the beaten path. Like what? So if I want to cornrow it. Did which you, I, which have I, you I, done it? Oh, I've cornrowed it before. Oh, That's what, part of my African-American past. Like, you have to, at one point in time. And what does she say about that? Yeah. I don't know about that, Brown. <laughs> oh, oh, that's, that's, oh, she calls. Knows. Does she call you Brown? She'll call me Brown from time to time or 2-5 because that was my number in high school. Oh. But, like, the idea of me doing something that is not as conservative as what she's been accustomed to mm. for the past several years. She's like, call. I didn't sign up for that. But yeah. what about your little boys? But they love it. Yeah. They love it. Wait, 2-5. What, what sport did you play? Football. What was your position? I was a fullback and an inside linebacker. Yeah, and did you yeah. play high school and college? Or? I played high school. And yeah. I'm like Al Bundy. I stopped playing after high school. <laughs> did Didn't you? Go be, I, at Stanford University, I thought about trying to walk on. The size of those yeah, men. Yeah, you were like, no, thank you. No, no, thank you. Do y'all, do the, do the, this is us cast still. Are you guys on a text chain or Heck, what are you doing? That's my family. <laughs> All day, like just the other day. Shout out to the show who won the HCA for Best Drama on Network yeah. Television. Wow. And shout out to Mandy Moore who won Best Female uh, Performer in a Lead oh, Role really? in a Drama. Mm. Incredibly well-deserving. Eight months pregnant. I love you, Mandy Moore. What is the, te tell, like, bring us into the text chain a little bit. Yeah. Like, what, who's the, uh, who is the most frequent texter? Let's see. I mean, everybody kind of takes turns. Um, where to, like, we'll, yeah. we'll say a lot of things. <laughs> uh, 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 Justin will say a lot of yeah. stuff. Sue actually kind of starts things up a lot oh, because she she'll be in New York a lot. Sue lives, she's the only yeah, person yeah. that lives in New York yeah. and everybody else is in LA. So she's like, what y'all doing? And she's up like, early. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Who's like your grandma or your mom who's like sending like cartoons and like yeah. viral videos and stuff? Chrissy Metz sends like <laughs> inspirational stuff. Oh, yeah. that's, that's Chrissy. She's that's the Chrissy. inspirational yeah. Metz. Yeah, that's what, yeah, that's Well, what. Sterling, we love you. We're excited for this project. I love you guys. Always great to see Sterling here in the studio. And you can catch Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul in theaters and on Peacock starting September 2nd. Stick around. Up next, an interview from our vault with the great Robert De Niro. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello. Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> we'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, did you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello. Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. Let's go. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to go spend some time with you. I appreciate it. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. Actor Robert De Niro and director Martin Scorsese have worked on multiple legendary films together over the years. And as De Niro now turns 79 tomorrow, we thought we'd take a second to look back at one of their greatest collaborations, the movie Raging Bull. The duo stopped by the Today Show way back in 1980. Robert De Niro is among the supreme film actors of our time, an Academy Award winner for Godfather II. Equally brilliant as a star of The Deer Hunter, Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, 1900, Bang the Drum Slowly. And now De Niro gives an extraordinary performance in Raging Bull, based on the life of former middleweight boxing champion Jake LaMotta. Raging Bull is often, has been directed by the often honored Martin Scorsese, who has directed De Niro in other films as well, including Taxi Driver. Robert De Niro almost never appears on television. But he's joining us today, this morning, with his director and close friend, Martin Scorsese, in the first of a three-part interview. Raging Bull, one of the best pictures of the year, opened all over the country this past weekend. And I asked Robert De Niro if he considers the character loathsome, a lowlife, and if so, what rules govern his portrayal of such a character? 
number one rule that you, as an actor, is that you have to empathize with your with who you're playing. If you can't, then you then you're either commenting on them or you're not really or or whatever. You're not really doing uh, doing them justice unless it's a satire of a sort. And even in then, in that case, it, it should be. Uh, uh, you should have some love for the character, something, some kind of um, sympathy, empathy, you know, and, and feeling. So, <clears throat> I mean, that you people would call him a low life, and I could call him a low life. But there are things about him that I see, uh, that I see in myself, and I also, uh, and that Marty yeah, sure. feels the same way, and that I, and we what, what attracted us both about him and the and in the book was the fact that was there were, there was a certain a certain power about it. There was a certain directness there about is. him as a character, being a fighter, being s more primitive, being supposedly more primitive, more direct. When you so play a role during the filming of that film, do you become so much immersed in that character that even when you're not shooting at the end of the day, are you still that character? Well, I have beat Marty up three All times. Times it hits me. It's embarrassing. I, I mean, during Raging Bull. Yeah, but I always Raging make Bull. sure that he's York, good enough. The next morning, he can shoot. Shoot. Make sure because I have the shots in my mind. He knows if I get in there. No, but I. No, you know, you do it. And then you go do you home. really, you really put it aside at night? Yeah, it's uh, one thing. This, uh, you go home. You, you know, I mean, you're all, when you're working on a move, on a movie, or I guess a, you know, also a play. I mean. It's always on your mind. I mean, on the weekend or if you have five days off shooting, maybe you'll go away. But it's always there in your mind somehow, and, and you're always relating it to something. If you see someone do something, and my yeah. mic is, I see yeah. anything. It's always, always there. You can't, you can't kind of escape it. Uh, uh, the obsession of until you finish. Mm -hmm. That's why there's a certain relief of finishing. And then. I always think of it as like putting my, like being underwater and holding my breath for, for, for 16 weeks. And then, and then, on the other hand, there's a certain kind of a depression because you're not, you're not doing, you're not getting up every morning, you're not working, you're not getting out there and actually doing it. So it's, uh, you know. Would you like to perform more frequently on the stage, or do you prefer film? I, I really like to do movies. <clears throat> I, I spoke to somebody who said to me, you know, we, as if I, you know, we know that you, you know. They they had the attitude that like I was that that I really should be doing plays and that doing movies was you know well we know you make a lot of money and all this and I said no I said I I, I must tell you that I really enjoy doing films very very much and uh, I I do you know that's simple how about heady feeling do you feel like you've really got it made that you are in total control of your careers and you you really have the ability and the energy to do what you want to do gee, gee. <clears throat> I don't mean that in the, in the pejorative sense at all. I mean, I mean, do you really feel, boy, I, I, I'm really in control. I know what I'm doing. I have the talent. I have the energy. And people will support what I want to do. No, because you know that, uh, like now, it's, you like the film, and it's nice, and people like the film. And, yeah, and we worked very hard on it, so it's nice to, to I mean, we, you know, it's, it's all nice, but it could be changed. In a year, it could be different. Do you consciously fight off the celebrity syndrome? Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, more or less, yeah, I do. I mean, you I don't walk into a restaurant and say, where's my table? No, I, I like to get treated well when you walk into a restaurant. <laughs> don't get me wrong. <laughs> I mean, it's better to help at times. You, know? <laughs> you don't get hassled when you walk in, and that's nice. But on the other hand, I don't like the all the other stuff, you know. Um, autographs? I don't mind. I'll sign autographs, you know. Um, but I like my own identity. I like to just to be and myself uh, and my privacy, whatever. When, I, when I'm in New York, for example, I'm in New York, or I'll walk down the street, I'll do this. I want to do what I want to do the way I always do it, and that's that's it. You know, that that's very important to me. That's one reason I don't like to do too many things, because I don't want to get too much exposure, like in this situation. Right. But um, but on the other hand, I don't want to not do it all because I'm not I'm not trying to be, you know, like I don't do anything. So, uh, but it's important because then people, everybody recognizes, everybody knows you. Hey, how you doing? And it can be a little. Uh, I can handle it, but I'd prefer just to be more anonymous. And uh, it's always been that way for me. But you, you know, feel insecure about your career, about your work? Huh? Of course.
You have fear? Of course. But the point is that the, that's what I meant about this picture. The only way, the only way to make a picture like this... Get out your worry, Beats. This is right over here. Get the Fun fact, Robert De Niro would go on to win the Oscar for his leading role in Raging Bull, and we are certainly wishing him a very happy early birthday. That's going to do it for today's Pop Star Plus. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. Welcome to our digital show today at 30. Yes, you are watching our half hour wrap up. As the name suggests, everything from the mm -hmm. show. But then we just condense it into 30 mm -hmm. minutes. And we're going to start this morning with the growing war of words between the Justice Department and Donald Trump over the FBI search of his Mar a Lago home. Kristen Walker's got a full report just ahead. She does. And then all eyes on the Wyoming primary today with vocal Trump critic Liz Cheney. She's fighting to keep her seat. We'll have the latest to end what that race could signal about the future of the Republican Party. All that plus an exclusive look at the future of air travel. How does a three-hour flight from New York to Paris mm. sound to all of you? Sounds good. <laughs> Even if it takes 10 hours, it sounds good, but three yeah. hours is better. Mm. Tom Costello has the details. And today, today marks 45 years since the loss of Elvis. So many people around the world are celebrating his music, his movies, his legacy, and earlier we were able to talk to Priscilla Presley. She joined us live from the Jungle Room in Graceland and how she's on the King of Rock and Roll. So all that coming up on Today, Today in 30. 30. We're going to start with NBC's Kristen Welker. She's in D.C. for us this morning. Good morning, Kristen. Hoda and Savannah, good morning to both of you. The focus is intensifying over whether to release the documents at the very heart of the search of Mar-a-Lago. And overnight, the former president forcefully calling for the affidavit to be unsealed as concern mounts for the safety of law enforcement all across the country. Overnight, former President Trump calling for the immediate release of the completely unredacted affidavit in the interest of transparency on his social media platform. It comes as federal prosecutors push to keep key documents related to the search of Mr. Trump's Mar-a-Lago home from public view, revealing that the document has information about important witnesses. Investigators asking a judge to keep the search warrant affidavit sealed following requests to unseal it from media companies including NBC News. The affidavit is believed to contain critical information about the government's investigation into the alleged mishandling of classified materials. Prosecutors argue making it public would cause significant and irreparable damage to the ongoing criminal investigation, which involves highly classified materials and highly sensitive information about witnesses. To me, until we see specificity within the affidavit, we will not have the kind of clarity that the American people need. Earlier, Mr. Trump accused the FBI of stealing his three passports during the search. The FBI responding overnight, saying it follows search and seizure procedures ordered by courts, then returns items that do not need to be retained for law enforcement purposes. A Justice Department official telling NBC News the passports have been given back to the former president. Mr. Trump has spent the last week attacking the FBI, baselessly accusing agents of planting evidence at Mar-a-Lago. That comes as the FBI and DHS step up security around the country after a spike in threats against law enforcement. Now, in an interview with Fox News, Mr. Trump warning the temperature has to be brought down in the country. If it isn't, terrible things are going to happen. And the current commander in chief is watching it all closely. In fact, a White House official tells NBC News that President Biden is being kept apprised of the threats against law enforcement. Hoda. In the meantime, Kristen, some other big news overnight. Rudy Giuliani coming into the spotlight, a separate criminal investigation that's related back to the 2020 election. What do you know about that? 
Dakota, that's absolutely right. And this could be significant. A lawyer for Rudy Giuliani telling NBC News he is now a target of the criminal investigation in Georgia into former President Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election. That lawyer had previously said and was told that Giuliani was a witness. Now, Giuliani, of course, was former President Trump's attorney at the time and played a major role in trying to change the election outcome in Georgia. I've been talking to legal experts overnight, Hoda, and they tell me that being labeled a target means prosecutors are looking more closely at whether Giuliani committed a crime. The DA's office right now not commenting. Hoda. All right, Kristen Welker for us there in Washington. Kristen, thank you. Let's keep it going on politics and go to today's primary showdowns, the most closely watched one in Wyoming. Liz Cheney, a leader in the Republican resistance to Donald Trump is locked in a tense fight for her political future. NBC's Von Hillier joins us from Jackson. Hi, Von. Good morning. Good morning, Savannah. Despite Donald Trump facing these multiple investigations, he is still finding loyalty from candidates and voters, potentially Wyoming ones here today. And if Liz Cheney, though, loses this primary, it'd be an underlining of the GOP's dramatic evolution. It's been the race at the top of mind for Donald Trump all year. I think this is the most important election election that we have right here. The effort to oust Congresswoman Liz Cheney, once the number three Republican in the House, will come to a head today in Wyoming. Cheney, after voting to impeach Trump last year, now helping lead the January 6th Select Committee's investigation into Donald Trump's role around the Capitol Hill attack. President Trump summoned the mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. She is now fighting to hold on to the seat she's held since 2017. But Trump endorsing another Republican, Harriet Hageman, who echoes his 2020 election falsehoods. The two campaigned together in the state earlier this summer. We're fed up with Liz Cheney. Trump has gone on the attack against those in the GOP who he perceives to be undermining his power in the Republican Party. Cheney at the top of that list. Liz, you're fired. Get out of here. Get out of here. Ten Republicans in the House voted to impeach Trump. Three were already beat this summer in their own re-election efforts, and four others chose to step aside and retire. Cheney's battle today, representative of the GOP's transformation. In May of last year, she was ousted from her leadership role in Congress by her fellow Republicans, speaking then about Trump's control of the GOP. What is the hold that President Trump has on the party? Well, it's very dangerous. How do you explain it? I think it's a cult of personality. And I think people were, were betrayed and misled by him. It's a real betrayal now that he's willing to try to unravel the democracy to get back into power. And now, with that hold, if anything, intensified, Cheney bringing in her father, the former vice president, in Wyoming Representative Dick Cheney. There has never been an individual who is a greater threat to our republic than Donald Trump. The political fate of the Cheneys, however, will come at the hands of voters. Why not Liz Cheney? She went against Trump. She voted for, for yeah. the impeachment. She's a sellout. Yes, betrayal. Now, if Cheney loses this primary today, she'd serve out the rest of her term through the end of the year, including continuing to help lead the January 6th Select Committee. Before Cheney, though, I was talking with an ally of hers who tells me that whether she's in or out of office, she'd continue to focus her energy on making sure that Donald Trump never returns to the Oval Office. And as she directly told you last year, Savannah, she will do, quote, whatever it takes. And that could potentially even mean her own 2024 presidential run. Savannah? All right, we shall see Von Hilliard and Jackson for us. Thanks. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. 
To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Another major airline jumping into supersonic air travel. American Airlines now placing a very big order as it hopes to bring back the age of the Concorde flying from New York to Paris in just over three hours. NBC's Tom Casella broke the story of Boom Supersonic last summer and he's back with an update. Good morning to you, Tom. I think a lot of people want to know how soon this could happen. Can you say boom? It'll be that fast. <laughs> boom! It looks like the earliest passenger flights could be in 2029. But today, American Airlines becomes the third major airline to announce an order to go supersonic, which means by the end of the decade, you may be able to go to Paris faster than it takes right now to fly across the country. Time to create the world's fastest airliner. Could the future of aviation actually be retro? Time to turn the past into the present. Like back to the Concorde. It was 2003 when the Concorde last flew passengers over the Atlantic at twice the speed of sound. But the Concorde was too loud and too expensive. A fatal crash in 2000 put an end to the program. Now, Denver's Boom Aviation is promising to take travelers back to the future with a four-engine plane it calls Overture. It's about time. New this morning, American Airlines has signed on, ordering 20 of its own supersonic planes, following United Airlines, which has already ordered 15, both with options for more. Other customers include Japan Airlines and the U.S. Air Force. There are going to need to be hundreds of Overture aircraft to carry the tens of millions of passengers around the world who can benefit from supersonic. You think that many people want to go supersonic? I think everybody wants to go supersonic. Last year, Boom's CEO gave us a tour. So if I'm a United passenger, I may be flying your supersonic jet by the end of the decade. By the end of the decade, you know, we want to do supersonic as quickly as possible. We think the world needs this. Boom says its planes will be lighter, smaller, quieter, and slightly slower than Concorde. Concorde flew at Mach 2. Boom will fly at Mach 1.7, cutting current flight times in half. New York to London in three and a half hours, Seattle to Tokyo, four and a half, with planes carrying up to 80 passengers. So every seat, you're going to have a large window where you can see the view from 60,000 feet, the curvature of the earth, the sky a deeper blue. Boom says its engines will use 100% sustainable fuels. The real question, how many people will pay for a faster supersonic flight? Are there enough people who would be willing to pay four, five, six thousand dollars to fly between New York and London in just three and a half hours? Maybe, but it's a limited market. But this morning, American and United Airlines believe if you build it, the customers will come. Now, you may recall a lot of people complained about how loud the old Concorde was. Boom says engine technology has evolved and improved over the past 20 years. They'll fly at Mach 1.7. That's over 1,300 miles per hour over the oceans. When they're over land, though, they'll be under Mach 1. They promise noise reduction systems to meet the noise control laws that are around airports right now. Chanel? People are going to be talking about this one. All right, thank you, Tom. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on yes. this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it. Yeah. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? 
can you update us on the status of negotiations? The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. As we mentioned this morning, today marks 45 years since the death of Elvis Presley. And a lot of events are being held to remember him today. Yeah, in just a moment, we're going to speak with Priscilla Presley, who is live from Graceland. But first, NBC News Now anchor Joe Fryer takes a look at the King's ongoing legacy. Hey, Joe. Hey there. So think about this. This is hard to imagine. More than half the population is below the age of 45 right now in the U.S., which means they weren't alive during Elvis's life. Yet interest in his life and his music music remains incredibly high after all these years. The love for Elvis is still burning through his movies and his moves. Those signature swivels and shakes are still rattling and rolling today. In new movies like Baz Luhrmann's Elvis, and on social media, where the king courts a new audience that can't help falling in love. And that love is not just confined to the screen. Loyal fans can slip on their blue suede shoes and drive their pink Cadillacs to Graceland, where Elvis lived and Angie Marchese works. Basically, I have probably one of the coolest jobs you can ever imagine. Why is it the coolest job in the world? Because I get paid to play with Elvis's stuff. She started as a tour guide 33 years ago and worked her way up to vice president, managing more than one and a half million items in the Graceland archive. You never got to meet him, but I bet you feel like you know him. I feel like he's kind of my long lost uncle that I never got a chance to meet, but I know everything about. Of course, Graceland still welcomes the longtime diehard Elvis enthusiasts, but lately the guest list is all shook up. Newer, younger fans are stopping by after seeing that new Elvis movie or discovering his music on streaming services. Elvis still has that charisma that's able to attract fans nearly 45 years after his passing. So if he were around today performing, you think he'd still be a pretty big deal? Yeah, I think Elvis would still be a pretty big deal. I think Elvis will always be a pretty big deal. So big, thousands of fans still gather at Graceland around this time every year for Elvis Week, with a few events hosted by his former wife Priscilla, all to keep his legacy alive, a burning love story. And right now we are nearing the end of Elvis week. The celebration at Graceland includes music, movies, and last night a candlelight vigil at the gates of Graceland with thousands of people who were in attendance. Wow, oh, that's a beautiful story. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Uh, let's welcome in Priscilla Presley. She's in the famed jungle room at Graceland. Priscilla, it's so good to see you. We were just hearing Joe talk about all the beautiful public displays of love and affection, but... I was just thinking when you woke up this morning, today it's been 45 years, what was going through you? Oh my gosh, it's a big, it's a big week, that's for sure. And uh, to see the amount of people that still come to see Elvis is un unbelievable. We had the uh, vigil last night, the candlelight vigil, with 30,000 people showed up. So that says a lot. It's so meaningful. And mm -hmm. of course, Elvis is timeless and ageless in so many ways. Now there's been this new movie. And mm -hmm. do you feel like there's a new generation now that's starting to discover him and discover his music? 
Absolutely, absolutely, and especially since the movie. I mean, what a great movie. Baz Luhrmann, I have to say, is a genius. I don't know anyone else who could have, could, who could have done this, this movie uh, like he did. You know, he's, Baz does his own thing. I was a little concerned at first when I, I heard that Baz was going to do the movie. I actually met him. Uh, I, I invited him to my home. We spent about four hours together. He put me a little at ease, but still I didn't know how it was going to come out. So when, um, when I saw it, I saw it actually with Jerry Schilling. We had a private screening. And we didn't speak. We didn't. We didn't talk at all. And at the end, we went, "Wow, this mm. is this is Elvis. Wow. Truly, that is, it is su Elvis. that's such high praise from you to think that that's how you viewed that movie. Uh, yeah. I saw the movie, and I was just thinking there were so many moments that were difficult for someone who didn't know Elvis to watch. What was the most difficult part for you to see in that movie? Oh boy, um, you know, it's just the, it, well, you know, it was about Colonel and Elvis and the, Elvis's dream, you know, to take his career further. He wanted to do movies and serious movies. And Colonel Parker just, you know, he should have really probably, probably stayed a publicist because he just didn't have, he, he didn't take Elvis where he wanted to be. And that was hard because I lived it. I lived the arguments that they had. Um, I lived, you know, Elvis trying to explain that he didn't want to do the, the, the movies with all the girls and the beaches and everything, that he really wanted to, to do serious things. So living that with him and the, watching the movie, it brought back a lot of memories. It seems like Colonel Parker, I mean, when you watch the, when you see the movie and see the life, it seems so difficult. Almost saw, he almost saw Elvis just as a commodity, get him on stage, do whatever it takes. I was just wondering, all these years later, have you made peace with what happened with Colonel Parker? Did you ever make peace with him? Yes, I did. Um, this was, this was, there was two colonels. There was the colonel who was the manager, and there's colonel that was you know, very, very sweet and very, very nice. I mean, he took care of both his wives, the first one who passed away. He was always there for her and also his uh, his second wife as well. I was you know, had dinner with them and actually Elvis did too in Palm Springs. And so there was two sides to him, the business and of course the very gentle side of where he's not working and not, uh, you know, doing anything in show business, I should say. Um, but uh, yes, there was two sides to him. And um, he, he, he was actually, I think it was more, you know, he had to live, live out what Elvis wanted to do or he promised Elvis and that was he was going to make him a million dollars and um, he wanted to live up to what he promised Elvis. Well, so I think more than a million, but that was the. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think about you on a day like this, Priscilla, mm -hmm. and of course you were married. You met him so young. You were just a young teenager and later got married. And, you know, now you're the keeper of his legacy. Mm -hmm. and, and what does that mean to you? Why do you do it? What does it mean to you? It, it's a big responsibility, uh, yes. But um, I want to, you know, carry it out and give him the things that he always wanted to do and wanted in his life. Um, a lot of it, many of it, well, not many, but he wanted to, you know, sing with uh, an orchestra. And I was able to get the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra to be, of course, the symphony of which he would be singing with and uh, carry that out for him. That was his dream. So anything that he wanted to do or wished to do as far as um, in life, uh, I want to try to get that to happen. Well, Priscilla, it's such a joy to speak with you, especially on this day. I hope you, you enjoy the rest of the festivities that are for the rest of the day today. Thank you again for joining us. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to go really spend some time with you. Appreciate it.
our country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. If the summer break has left your home, let's just say, a little less organized than you'd like, do not worry because the incredible ladies, our friends from the Home Edit, they got you covered. Yeah, with a hit Netflix series, two best-selling books, and an Instagram account with nearly 7 million followers. Clea Shearer and Joanna Te- uh, Teplin are helping people declutter their zone and one now, place at a time. Yeah, they are, and they're out with their second issue of the Home Edit magazine. And Clea is going to join us now from her office in Nashville. We'll talk about the mag in a bit. But Clea, as you have been so brave in sharing with the world, Mm -hmm. you are currently uh, going through chemo Mm -hmm. for breast cancer. You have been such a warrior Mm. and you've really been kind to share this journey with everybody. So I know everybody wants to know how you're doing and how Mm -hmm. you're feeling. Hi, guys. Um, I miss you. I wish I was in studio, Um, but I am doing well. I'm plugging away, you know, one day at a time, one week at a time. Um, My motto is cancer free by Christmas. So um, that's what that's what I'm hoping for. You know, everybody has their own sort of mental way that they get through this. And you've had some difficult, difficult moments when you thought you were done with chemo. You ended up having it having to go a step back and you started it all up again. So what is it you tell yourself when you wake up in the morning or how do you deal with what you're going through? Well, my son drew me a picture the other day. We were at a restaurant and he, he was just coloring on a kid's menu and he drew me a picture that said, you're braver than a lion. <laughs> and after I was done, like, you know, silently sobbing at that, um, I, I realized that every single day I have to be braver than a lion, not just for me, but for them. And I don't want them to think that their mom is sick. I look Mm -hmm. at my treatment as something that's healing, even though sometimes it makes me sick. Um, So I just, you know, every single day, I'm like, I need them to feel that I am just as alive and vibrant as as they think I am. And, um, you know, I need to wake up every day and be their mom. I think that most of us wake up um, who are moms with that mentality. So Mm -hmm. it's just a little little extra push for me these days. One of the things you're really good at is finding that silver lining. Mm -hmm. And I loved hearing from you about how you are embracing this season of life and how, you know, it's forced you to slow down. I mean, Mm -hmm. we know, Clea, that you are amazing. Look behind Mm -hmm. you. It's all rainbow (laughs) organized (laughs) and you're a go-getter and you're used to just being like the type AAAA plus personality. But what has it been like to to slow down and and Mm -hmm. embrace a different pace of life? Well, um, it's not normal for me to slow down. Um, And I actually, I I think about, you know, before I announced publicly, actually, I think the day before I announced publicly that I had breast cancer, I actually was at uh, the Mm -hmm. Today offices. I was with Hoda and I confided in Hoda that I had breast cancer and she held my hand, Hoda, thank you, and said, this is, you need to slow down. Mm -hmm. And this might be, you know, the way the universe is kind of forcing you to slow down Mm -hmm. a little bit. And um, I think that that's exactly right. So this has been a a time of learning how to be patient, of learning how to not be in control of things, Mm -hmm. of learning how to just be a little more quiet, um, to find some solace and peace and calm um, and not just have to be go, go, go. So um, it's a it's a real it's a real test for me. This is this is not normal, but (laughs) I I've been you know, again, I've been plugging away and I, I, I'm going to do it. So I'm, I'm making it through. Well, you are doing it. Yeah, you definitely are. And we just want to celebrate your magazine, too. That's a good thing to celebrate. And I, a little birdie told me that if you leaf through the pages of this edition of your magazine, the second <laughs> edition, we'll find someone we know very well and love. You've got Miss Savannah Guthrie in there. Yes, you will. Savannah's Kitchen. Well, first of all, Savannah herself looking yes. stunning. Uh, but Savannah's Kitchen, Pantry, um, you know, our team was so excited to create a hub, you know, for the family and, you know, turn her already gorgeous apartment just that much up. Um, how with hard some was it to organize? I know. How <laughs> hard was it? Don't try to make it her feel like good. An army. <laughs> no, come an on. An army came. <laughs> 
No, Savannah's actually pretty well organized already. So it's it's never hard. You know, this is the second time we've we've organized for Savannah, and um, it's it's always a pleasure. So it took it's, two times. It's never okay, good. I'm just, just, Savannah has it down. Just making, <laughs> just making sure we've got you it. Clear. The funniest thing that you're going to appreciate, Clea. So I was wearing this dress that I've had for a lot of years. I think I wore it when I was yeah. pregnant, so it's like an old dress and too big for the shoot. So then they're like, that dress is sort of you know dumpy or whatever. I'm like, you know, what we need to tighten it up. We'll just put some chip <laughs> clips, which you guys had helpfully organized so I knew just where to find See, those potato now chip clips Savannah. and that's how we Thank did you. it. Thank you. That's exactly Perfect. what I wanted to hear. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, so that works. <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth. That's the truth of it. Well, oh. it's incredible. You guys yeah. have your show. You have the magazine. Mm. The magazine's cool because you have a lot of like tips and tricks because sometimes I think, I, I know I'm intimidated. I can't do what you yeah. guys do. But you have a lot of tips and tricks in there. Yeah. We do. And, you know, in addition to your kitchen, we have a lot of other lifestyle things. In addition to kind of organizing tips and tricks, we have our friend Heather McMahon featured in the issue. Um, she gives kind of her guest room do's and don'ts. We have our friend Tan France from Queer Eye. He gives some fashion advice. So we're trying to kind of run the gamut um, and, you know, feature all sorts of things that could be helpful to people, whether mm -hmm. it's organization or whether it's just lifestyle. All right. Well, yes. Cleo, we love you. Love you, Cleo. You're an inspiration. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Keep going. You're the best. Mm -hmm. By the way, you can pre-order the fall issue Thank of the you. Home Edit Feel Good Organizing Magazine starting next Tuesday. Hope you like that. We will see you back here tomorrow for another big show. Have a great Tuesday, everybody. Hello today all day. Up next on Hashtag Cooking, Samadata making two protein-packed recipes with a pantry staple, canned chickpeas. First, she's going to use the chickpeas to make a hearty dinner with a chana masala and roasted sweet potatoes. For dessert, she's going to turn the legume into ooey gooey chocolatey brownies. We promise you won't even taste the chickpeas. Just get out your aggression on these sweet potatoes, okay? If you have any stress in your life, don't take it out on your friends. Make this recipe. Take it out on these potatoes. My life would not run without chickpeas. Whether in savory recipes or sweet, chickpeas are truly the legume loves of my life. I guess you could really say I'm a hashtag chickpea chick. I'm going to show you two of my favorite recipes to use chickpeas, my chana masala stuffed sweet potatoes, and a delicious and surprising chickpea brownie. I know, once you make these recipes, you're going to love chickpeas as much as I do. Chana masala, sometimes called chole, is a spiced chickpea curry that my mom used to make for me all the time when I was growing up. It's one of my favorite Indian vegetarian dishes, so today I thought I'd get a little creative and stuff the chana masala inside some baked sweet potatoes. So, if baked potatoes are your vibe and spiced chickpeas are your vibe, then this is the recipe for you. I've got all of my cute sweet potatoes here. They're clean, so I'm just gonna poke them with a fork so they can release steam when they bake. Don't mistake your hand for a potato, okay? Promise me you won't do that. Keep your eyes on your goal. All right, I definitely did some damage here. Now I'm just gonna rub these potatoes with some olive oil and then sprinkle with some salt. These potatoes are at the spa currently. They're loving their lives. They're about to go into the sauna. <laughs> I only find myself funny. The olive oil is gonna allow the sweet potatoes to get nice and crisp on the outside. I love eating the skin too, it's really yummy. Now, just a little sprinkle of salt. We can't forget to season everything. We need flavor everywhere. My cutie little potatoes are ready. They're going in the oven 40 to 45 minutes at 425 degrees. Now that my sweet potatoes are safely in the oven, they're secure in there, I am gonna start on my chana masala. First thing I'm gonna do is dice my onions. Just clearing my workspace, nothing to see here. I love using onions in basically everything, but onions, garlic, and ginger are just key aromatics in Indian cooking. You really can't have Indian cooking without them. Now for my garlic, just gonna mince it. 
A mince is really, really fine, so you just wanna get all of that delicious garlicky flavor out. You know you did this right if you smell like garlic for three days. We're just getting out all of that flavor. Now I'm just gonna use some ginger. A really easy way to peel ginger is to use a spoon. You can just use it to scrape back that little peel, like so. See how easy that is? Super easy. And I'm using only an inch here. Now I'm just gonna mince my ginger up super fine. I wanna extract all that flavor, just so it matches the garlic too. Okay, my onions, my garlic, my ginger, we're all ready, ready for the hot oil. So now I'm just gonna heat some oil in my medium pot until it shimmers, and then I'll add all of my aromatics. Heating up my olive oil in my pot. Once the oil shimmers, then I know it's ready for the onions. Taking a little peek, the olive oil is shimmering, so it's time to add my onions. I want to cook these onions in the olive oil until they're tender, translucent, and starting to brown around the edges. I want to get some color on them before I add the ginger and the garlic. And the reason that we're not adding the garlic and the ginger in with the onions is because those take a lot less time to cook. So we want to get the onions going and then we'll add the ginger and garlic so those two don't burn. I think these onions are ready to meet their garlic and ginger companions. Smell. Mmm. We want to cook the garlic and ginger in with the onions for about one to two minutes so it smells aromatic and fragrant. Get rid of that raw smell. This is my masala box, my masala dubba, my prized possession. I have literally never lived a single day in my kitchen without it. It's how I store all of my favorite spices. It's also how my mom taught me to store all of my spices. Let me show you a little reveal. Look at that. These are all my favorite spices that I use. And these are also the ones that are gonna go in my chana masala. My onions, garlic, and ginger smell amazing. They look amazing, which means it's time for my masala. I'm going to add some of my favorite masala spices here. I like to add cayenne for some heat, for some spice. Adding turmeric, one of my favorite spices. A lot of cumin, I absolutely love it. Time for some coriander powder. Adding that straight in. Did you know that coriander powder is just the seeds of cilantro ground up? Now you know. Now I'm just gonna add a little bit of salt and pepper. So I want to roast my masala spices until that raw masala smell goes away. We want to toast it, we want it to smell fragrant and aromatic. And finally, my little secret ingredient, umchur powder, or dry mango powder. Umchur powder is so tangy, it's Heart, it adds a little something extra into this chana masala. Adding umchur powder was definitely my mom's tip, so thank you, mom, for making my chana masala a lot better than it was before. I wish you could smell it, but you can't. So you're just gonna have to make it. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't make the rolls, but I am making them a little bit here. Okay, my masala smells amazing, smells super aromatic. Now I'm gonna add my tomato paste. I want to cook the tomato paste in with my onions and spices until it deepens in color. Now I'm going to add my tomatoes. You can use fresh tomatoes for sure, but I'm using canned and crushed tomatoes because I think convenience is the most gorgeous thing.
My tomatoes are looking delicious. Delish. Now I'm gonna add my vegetable broth. Okay, I've brought everything to a boil. Now I'm just gonna reduce to a simmer and cook uncovered for five minutes. We have to add a very important friend to the party. Our chickpeas. I could never forget about them. How could you think that? Adding them straight in here. Get them really up in that gravy. Now that the chickpeas have found a really nice home in here, I just want to simmer this together for 20 minutes. I want the gravy to become thick and the chickpeas to really infuse in with all of that masala. Make sure you cover this while it simmers. Well, Ukrainians were defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who's this? This These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? I found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, 20 minutes has passed. I think it's time we take a peek at my chana masala. I mean, look at that. Look how thick it is. It looks delicious. It smells even better. There is one more thing that I do like to add in my chana masala. It's just a little sneaky spinach. <laughs> Nothing to see here. Just some sneaky spinach. You won't even see it or taste it. I just like to sneak in some cute greens in there from time to time, you know? Just adding a handful. I'm just gonna tear it, roughly. No science to that here. And I'm gonna stir it into my chana masala until it wilts. Speaking of something green, I do like to add a little bit of cilantro in here as well, something zesty, herby. Brings all of the flavors to light. I keep those tender stems, but I'll remove the thick stems like this. This doesn't have to be added to our chana masala. All this talk about cilantro has me craving something. My cilantro mint chutney. I'm gonna show you how to make that. I'm just gonna let this hang out while I do that. Let me just start off by saying that I love chutney. A life without chutney is one that I just don't want to live. If you're not eating chutney, you are not living. Chutney is super popular in Indian food, especially Indian street food. I find that it's zesty, it's bright. It's usually with a lot of herbs, a lot of spices, a lot of lemon or something acidic. It's super delicious and really tangy. Let's make my favorite cilantro mint chutney. This, by the way, is so easy to make. You're just gonna throw everything in your blender gonna get my cilantro ready. Again, just like in my chana masala, where it's okay to keep those tender stems on the cilantro, I'm just gonna keep the tender ones, but remove the thicker ones. These are a bit more bitter, so we don't want these in our chutney. Like I said, 
super simple recipe. You can add everything to our blender. I don't know why these spatulas are in here. They wanted their 15 seconds of fame. <laughs> Remove them. I'm gonna add my cilantro straight into my blender. Like that. Mint is super floral. It's very bright. So I find that it complements the cilantro really well. And anything you add this in is just gonna really awaken the flavors. If the flavors were sleeping, this chutney is gonna awaken the flavors. I love some heat, I love some spice. So we're gonna be adding a full green chili here. If you want it to be less spicy, you can de-seed it. But I will not be partaking in that. I want all the spice. Just gonna trim it, pop it straight in there. Yes, I live life a little risky. It's just how I do. Just juicing a fresh lemon in. Nothing like some fresh lemon juice. It's gonna really brighten all of those flavors up. Add something a bit acidic, which we need with all of those zesty herbs. Now for my spices, I'm gonna add some salt and a little cumin. My precious box. Little cumin. And some salt. Now I'm just gonna add a little bit of water to help get the blender going. You can feel free to add more water as you blend, just if you need to get the blender moving a bit more. Texture looks great. Oh, it smells so good too. That, as you can see, some nice texture. I wanted this to be a little thinner because I will be drizzling it on top of my chana masala stuffed sweet potatoes. I'm gonna set this aside, go check on my potatoes, and then I'm gonna get ready to plate. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. I mean, it is literally oozing sweetness. Look at that caramelization. <sighs> okay, so I have to tell you something. Chana masala is typically served with roti, naan, or rice, but I wanted to get a little fun here, a little creative, so I'm gonna stuff my chana masala into my sweet potatoes. I know. Take it down now. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, 
I think we're ready to plate. I think I'm ready to eat. That I know for sure. I am gonna get this potato right here. That is the one that I want. This is the chosen one. Look at all of that sugar that's just caramelized around the edges. <gasps> okay, you need to look at this. Do you see this? Do you see it? Okay, onto my plate we go. I love a sweet potato. Love, literally love. Time to bring my chana masala into the picture. I'm gonna move these guys aside. I will see you later. Time for you. Does everyone talk to their food like I do? <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. I'm gonna cut my sweet potato. Just create a little slit right here. Just a little home for that chana masala to sit in. Look at that steam. Mm. Perfect. Now it's time for my chana masala. Oh, that smells so good. I'm gonna get a little bit of everything, that thick gravy, the chickpeas, my sneaky spinach. Straight inside. It fits perfectly. Little home for my chana masala. Great. Okay. Now, did not forget about my cilantro chutney. This is gonna add some brightness, some freshness, and a little bit of spice. Now, just for a little bit of glam, we're gonna add some chopped, or I should say, torn cilantro. A little on the plate, just to, you know, aesthetics. I can assure you that my mom has never done this before, so I have to show her a picture. I wanna see what she's gonna think. She will be proud of this chana masala though because that looks pretty good. Mom, I hope you're proud. That looks so pretty. Aesthetically speaking, this looks amazing. Can I eat this now? I think yes, I think yes I can eat this now. I mean, this literally can do no wrong. It's hearty, it's satisfying, it's filling. It's very balanced. I think I really leveled up baked potatoes today. Perfect weeknight dinner, even lunch. That caramelization on that sweet potato is just getting me. I just can't even handle it. it looks so good. We all think of chickpeas in something like a chana masala, right? But here's the secret, I really like to bake with them in my desserts. I know, I know you're questioning my life choices right now, but just you wait. I'm gonna go get the ingredients for my chickpea brownies. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. 
Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? These chickpea brownies are one of the most popular recipes on my blog. And because I know you're wondering, I know you're asking the question, can you taste the chickpeas? All I have to say to you is no. All they do is simply create an irresistible fudgy texture. And with chocolate involved, everyone wins. So let's get to it. First thing I'm gonna add in here is some almond butter. I like this because it's kind of rich, it's nutty. It adds a lot to these brownies. Now we're gonna add my chickpeas, my most valuable pantry player, my MVPP, my chickpeas. Make sure before you add these chickpeas into your blender, you rinse them super, super well. And just remember, the chickpeas don't add any flavor to these brownies. All they do is help to create a really nice fudgy texture and make it really satiating when you eat it. Now I'm gonna go for some vanilla extract. Delish. To sweeten these chickpea brownies up, I'm gonna use some coconut sugar. Beautiful. Now, for my flour in these brownies, I'm not actually using a bunch of it at all. I'm gonna use some almond flour. It's kind of dense, it's delicious. It's also gonna help create a nice and fudgy brownie. What I like about almond flour is that it's just almonds, right? So that creates some really good texture and also a really nice nutty finish. Okay, we've gotta have a little bit of cocoa powder. I'm using unsweetened cocoa powder here. This is really important. We don't want anything added to our cocoa powder. We want it to be pure. And we're already adding sugar to our brownie, so no need to buy a sweetened cocoa powder. To help everything blend, I'm gonna add some almond milk now and a little bit later too. Are you ready for the blender brownies of your dreams? Are you ready to not make a smoothie and make brownies instead? Same. Okay, here we go. Perfection, perfection. I'm gonna scrape the sides down, give it another little blend. You want it to be super, super smooth. You literally never know there are chickpeas in here. It's actually kind of scary. <laughs> okay, you gotta look at this texture. You just, you gotta look at this texture. Come on now, that's just not fair. Super velvety, really smooth. Just needs one thing, chocolate chips. Cause it's me. And why would I make a brownie without chocolate chips? It just doesn't seem right. Make sure you remove this from the blender before you add your chocolate chips so you don't blend up some chocolate chips into the air. No, that is not speaking from personal experience. to fold in my chocolate chips. I do not measure this with anything but my heart and my soul. Now it's time to transfer into my pan. Gotta get a shot of this. The texture is luscious. <gasps> I know there's chickpeas in here, isn't that crazy? You really could fool a lot of people. I'm not saying do that. I'm not saying trick people, but like, I'm just saying you could. Have you ever wondered what the difference is between a chickpea and a garbanzo bean? Well, I have news for you. There is no difference. They're the same thing. Garbanzo is just the Spanish term for a chickpea. This just looks nice, honestly, plus a little extra chocolate never hurt anyone. <laughs> I gave up. Okay, we are ready for the oven. Going in 350 degrees for 35 to 40 minutes, and I'm so excited for their journey.
my pride and joy, my chickpea brownies. I've let them cool for 25 minutes. This is important because it lets them firm up. And when they come out of the oven, you know that they're done when they start to pull away from the sides of the pan. Look at how easy parchment paper makes my life. All right. I mean, look at how fudgy that is. Delish. All that has to happen, it's time for me to eat it. Okay, I think I'm ready to taste. Oh, it's so fudgy. Mmm. This is my party trick, putting chickpeas into brownies. I just need to take a picture of that interior, that fudgy bit. Mm. It's too good. It is crazy how you can't taste the chickpeas. They just add to that really nice fudgy texture. They've got some rich chocolate, so they taste super decadent, but they're also super satiating. And so fudgy, melt in your mouth. The extra chocolate chips. Nobody's mad about that. I'm not mad about it. I hope this inspired you to use chickpeas in new and fun, unique ways, even baking them into brownies. Now you know why they're so versatile and also why they're the legume love of my life. Hi everybody, happy Tuesday. I've got two major stories for you. The battle between the Justice Department and Donald Trump. And the closely watched Liz Cheney race in Wyoming. It is August the 16th. This is today. A warrant war. The DOJ comes out strongly against the release.